morning, everyone. Could I ask you all please to take your seats? We'll get proceedings underway. Thank you and welcome. My name, for those of you who don't know me, is Anne Trimmer. I'm the Secretary General of the AMA. Uh, we will start formal proceedings very shortly, but just to make sure that we've set the scene for the day, um, could you please make sure that mobile phones are turned off or onto silent so we don't have a cacophony of sounds during the morning? I need to tell you about fire exits. You exit through the doors that you came into this room. The first alarm is the, a normal sort of be alert alarm, and the second alarm will be an evacuation alarm, at which point you follow the directions of the hotel staff to the nearest exit. The assembly point is Treasury Gardens, which is behind uh, this building, across the road and adjacent to the um, parliamentary buildings. The bathrooms, again, you go out through the doors that you came in on and they are to the left. Could I remind you also that under the standing orders, if you have any urgency motions that you would like to have considered later in the proceedings today, you need to have them lodged with Lauren at the motions table by one o'clock today. Our program runs very tightly up until lunch break at one, so there may not be another opportunity to remind you. So this is your, your notice to, to do that. And could I also, before um, the official party arrives, just remind you about an event tomorrow morning which is a little bit special to one of our delegates in particular. The Shift Theatre is going to perform a segment of a play um, focusing on the role of women doctors in war, and it leads into one of our plenary sessions tomorrow. But I really urge you to make sure that you don't sleep in and you don't linger over your breakfast, but that you are here for that event because it, it is something quite special. So with all of that by way of housekeeping and background, could I please ask you to be upstanding for the arrival of the official party? Good morning, everybody. Please sit. Well, I'd like to welcome all delegates um, here today to our national conference. The Australian Medical Association, delegates and guests, would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which this conference is held, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and all Aboriginal peoples within these lands from whatever Aborig Aboriginal nation they may come. I'd like to introduce Ian Hunter, who will welcome us to country. Ian Hunter is a Wurundjeri man. His relatives go back to William Barrack, who signed the treaty with John Batman for the land for the city of Melbourne. Ian, welcome. Woman Jika, Namaji Bemet, Wurundjeri Balak, Gemen Kundibik, Wurundbrach. Welcome, non Indigenous people and all, to the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people from Wurundbrach. I am Ian Hunter, a descendant of the Wurundbrach. The first words I spoke were in the Woiru language of the Wurundjeri. 
This is the language that could have been spoken for 40 to 50,000 years by my ancestors, but owing to early prohibitation to speak our language when first white settlers came upon our lands, I have now to memorise sentences from a prophetic dictionary. The greeting I convey to you is from my father, traditional elder, landowner of the greater northern regions of Melbourne. He is Warrenbrutch, or in our new language, Young Wombat. I am his only son, Jitty Jitty. And my father in the traditional times would have been an elder and advisor. I place gum leaves before you as my forebears would have to welcome you to the lands which upon you receive open the bush to you to partake of the abundance while living within our country. But also we give the leaves today as a gesture of reconciliation and with you taking of the leaves, recognise that although we may have changed our appearance, that we, the descendants of the Wurundjeri people, should still be recognised as the traditional owners of Melbourne. Thank you. I'd now like to welcome Liz Cherry to the stage. So uh, Liz is uh, very well known to many of us. She's performed at numerous high profile events across Melbourne, such as the iconic AFL Anzac Day March and um, NRL matches. She's currently the singer for the Australian Army Band and has represented the Army around the country and internationally and she will lead us in singing the national anthem. Welcome, Liz. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. We've golden soil and wealth for toil, of beauty rich and rare in history's page let every stage advance australia fair in joyful strains then let us sing advance australia fair Um, we'll now um, ask you again to stand for the official reading of the Declaration of Geneva. I'll just give some background to the Declaration of Geneva, the Physician's Oath, originally adapted by the General Assembly of the World Medical Association of Geneva in 1948, amended in 1968, 83 and 94, revised in 2005 and 6. It's a declaration of the physician's dedication to the humanitarian goals of medicine, a declaration that was especially important in view of the medical crimes which had been committed in Nazi Germany. The Declaration of Geneva was intended as a revision of the Hippocratic Oath, restating that oath's moral truths in a modern way. I'll ask you to join me as I read the oath. At the time of being admitted as a member of the medical profession, I solemnly pledge to concentrate, consecrate my life to the service of humanity. I will give to my teachers the respect and gratitude that is their due. I will practice my profession with conscience and dignity. The health of my patient will be my first consideration. I will respect the secrets that are confided in me 
even after the patient has died. I will maintain by all means in my power the honour and the noble traditions of the medical profession. My colleagues will be my sisters and brothers. I will not permit considerations of age, disease or disability, creed, ethnic origin, gender, nationality, political affiliation, race, sexual orientation, social standing or any other factor to intervene between my duty and my patient. I will maintain the utmost respect for human life. I will not use my medical knowledge to violate human rights and civil liberties, even under threat. I make these promises solemnly, freely, and upon my honour. Thank you. Please sit. The President will now uh, in welcome our guests to this meeting. Delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to also welcome you all to National Conference, uh, my first complete conference as Federal President. We are joined at this conference by a number of special guests. I would first like to acknowledge the presence of some former AMA presidents at this conference. I will ask them to stand as I name them. Would you please welcome Dr. Bryce Phillips, President 1988 to 1990. <clears throat> Dr. Bill Glasson, President 2003-2005. Dr. Mikesh Heikawal, President 2005-2007. Associate Professor Rosanna Capalingua, President 2007-2009. Dr. Steve Hambleton, President 2011-2014. And Professor Brian Owler, President 2014-2016. The AMA is pleased and honoured to have with us some very distinguished overseas visitors. As I read your name, would you please come forward to the stage for a gift from the AMA as a token of our appreciation for your attendance. Please welcome from the New Zealand Medical Association, CEO Ms Leslie Clark. And from the Medical Association of Thailand, we welcome Deputy Secretary General, Professor Prakit Pantu Tommy Tichong. Uh, it is always exciting to host our friends from medical associations from around the world. It's now my privilege to introduce the President's address. It's hard to believe, Michael, it's only a year since we elected you as President. Like 400 metre runners, AMA Presidents require a combination of power, acceleration, speed and endurance. Michael, you came out of the start hard and you got up to race speed early. You then settled into your rhythm and pace and at times seemed almost to be enjoying yourself. <laughs> Halfway through, some lactic acid already and more to come. Michael, uh, we have a video to present our account of your race so far and then we look forward to hearing of your plans for the big finish. Doctors are continuing their campaign over a Medicare freeze and GP funding. Yeah, baby, yeah. 
the head of the Australian Medical Association has left his first meeting with the health minister, convinced the government is set to thaw the freeze on doctors' rebates through Medicare. Michael Gannon spoke to Susan Lee for more than an hour and says he'd be gobsmacked if the rebates were still frozen at the next election. We had a productive meeting today. I look forward to working with the minister, looking for areas of common ground. The head of the Australian Medical Association, Michael Gannon, says in no way would the outsourcing of the payment system equal the privatisation of Medicare. Well, everyone's entitled to their own opinion. He's head of the AMA. The AMA has been variously described as the most powerful non-government organisation in Australia, a well-oiled lobbying machine, and no doubt worse things behind closed doors in Parliament House. <laughs> While we've seen some changes, we still see the same health policies from before the election. Many of them are bad health policies. There's no doubt that health was a game changer in the election. It was very nearly a government changer too. Today I've received notice from the Honourable Susan Lee of her intention to resign as the Minister for Health, Ageing and Sport. Uh, my first call uh, was to uh, the head of the AMA, Michael Gannon, the uh, Medical Association. I've been having positive discussions uh, with both the new minister, Greg Hunt, and with the prime minister. The Australian Medical Association is calling for a national guns register, as promised by John Howard in 1996. It's doctors who pick up the pieces when someone is uh, accidentally or intentionally killed. Some of the insurers need to do better. Some of them need to get rid of their junk policies. The country's peak medical body says both sides of politics need to do better when it comes to Indigenous health care. Australian Medical Association presidents from around the country have visited Canberra's Wanunga Health Centre to coincide with Close the Gap Day. The Minister for Health is having, is having uh, productive discussions with the AMA. Uh, tonight the government has claimed back a lot of the goodwill it lost with its disastrous 2014 budget. Uh, the centrepiece is a, uh, a plan to re-index patient rebates. The country's peak doctors group has announced its support for same-sex marriage. The Australian Medical Association is calling on Canberra to end the argument, claiming it's a public health issue. It's time to remove this discrimination against a minority of our population. It's time to move forward. So thank you to the hard-working media team. I was dreading that, uh, but uh, it shows a year of, uh, of uh, advocacy, work and success. I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, colleagues, friends and guests. It has been another exciting and successful year for the AMA. So much has happened and happened quickly that it's hard for me to believe it was 12 months since I was elected president. I knew that it would be a step up from being a state AMA president to federal president, but I was wrong. It's more like several flights of stairs. The AMA is a key player in federal politics in Canberra. The range of issues we deal with every day is extensive. Our engagement with the government, the bureaucracy, with other health groups is constant. Our policy work across the whole health system is highly regarded. The AMA's political influence is significant. The political environment in which we operate was volatile over the past year, to say the least. We had a federal election at which the Liberal National Coalition was narrowly returned. I've worked with two health ministers, Susan Lee and Greg Hunt. The transition was seamless. The AMA has engaged openly and positively with all sides of the parliament, including the independents. Our standing is evidenced by the attendance at this national conference of Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, opposition leader Bill Shorten, Health Minister Greg Hunt, Minister for Aged Care and Minister for Indigenous Health, Ken Wyatt AM, Shadow Health Minister Catherine King, and Greens Leader, Senator Richard Di Natale. 
It is testament to the success of AMA advocacy that we have the most senior politicians in the land publicly acknowledging that health matters. No argument about the importance of our public hospitals. No argument that private health care supports universal health care by providing efficiency, choice and quality care. No argument that general practice remains central and critical to the health system. And no argument that prevention is better than cure. This is no accident. It is a result of the vigour and quality of our work. There's not time this morning to cover every aspect of our advocacy over the past year, so I'll only share with you some of the highlights. Of course, the issue that dominated medical politics until very recently was the long and ongoing freeze on patient rebates. This was a bad policy that hurt patients and doctors alike. I was pleased just weeks ago on budget night to welcome the government's decision to end the freeze. Patient rebates will be re-indexed over the next two years. We would have preferred an immediate across the board lifting of the freeze, but at least now practices can plan ahead with certainty. A crucial element of the AMA's successful advocacy is that the freeze will be lifted on rebates for the overwhelming majority of patient consultations in 12 months time. That's whether a patient is seeing a GP or another specialist. Lifting the freeze has effectively allowed the government to rid itself of the legacy of the disastrous 2014 budget. We can now move forward together on other priorities, things like public hospital funding, the MBS review after hours care, to name a few. These matters are spelt out in a shared vision statement agreed with government at budget time. Working constructively with government, we can give them a chance to get things like the healthcare home trial right, things like the My Health record right. But in no way does this mean that our future advocacy is limited. We will maintain our role of speaking out like no other body with complete and total independence, without fear or favour on any matter that needs to be addressed in health. The Medicare freeze hit general practice hard, but it's not the only problem making things tough for our hardworking GPs. General practice is under constant pressure, yet it continues to deliver great outcomes for patients. GPs deliver high quality care and are the most cost effective part of the health system, yet collectively they feel undervalued by government and sadly often by their leadership. One of the most divisive issues the AMA had to resolve in the past 12 months was the Turnbull government's ill-considered election eve deal with Pathology Australia to cap rents paid for co-located pathology collection centres. We all know that our pathologist members play a critical role in the healthcare team. They are essential to the decisions that clinicians make every single day. It was disappointing to see the government's deal pit pathologists against GPs. The pathology sector is right to demand that allegations of inappropriate rents are tackled. Equally, GPs and other doctors are entitled to charge rents that place a proper value on the space being let. Recent discussions with Minister Hunt saw the rents deal dumped in favour of a more robust compliance framework based on the existing laws. This is a much more balanced approach. We are a critical and constructive advisor to the government on the healthcare homes trial. We share the government's vision, but continue to provide robust policy input to ensure that it has some chance of success. The AMA secured a short delay in the rollout of the trial. The Minister knows our concerns about the adequacy of the funding, given the government is asking GPs to do more for patients, but with no additional funding. The AMA successfully lobbied the government to allow general practices more time to comply with the requirement to upload shared health summaries to the My Health record and a more modest upload target. But it is clear that much more work needs to be done to convince GPs and other specialists of the merits of the My Health record. Many GPs have expressed their concerns to the AMA about funding for after hours services and the proliferation of medical deputising services. While most deputising services provide essential services for patients, there is growing unease about the potential for fragmentation of care and the use of these services for what should be routine GP care. The central role of the patient's usual GP must not be compromised. We will work with the government to implement reforms informed by the outcomes of the MBS task force review of after hours GP services. The MBS review remains a work in progress. The AMA has always supported a modern MBS that reflects contemporary best practice. We want an MBS that provides for innovations and improvements 
and one that makes best use of the technical advances as they are introduced into practice. It is the patient's MBS rebate. It's often the basis upon which they can access care. To that end, we have stated that we support the vision of the MBS review. It is and must be clinician-led. It should consult widely. It should consider where new items are needed. But it should not, under any circumstances, be a cynical savings exercise. And we have received assurances that it will not be. I'm especially proud of the work we've done recently in the important area of doctor's health. This year, we lost a number of our colleagues to suicide including the Deputy Chair of the Council of Doctors in Training, one of our own, Dr Chloe Abbott. Chloe was an outstanding contributor to the AMA and her loss left us all stunned. Sadly, these are not isolated incidents. The health and wellbeing of our profession is a key issue for the AMA. We are working with the Medical Board of Australia to ensure that doctors have access to the support they need. Through our subsidiary company, Doctors Health Services, we are coordinating the delivery of more accessible and consistent services across the country. In 2016, we achieved a critical milestone with funding arrangements put in place with existing state and territory services that now cover the entire nation. A priority for the AMA is ensuring a medical workforce to meet future community need. We must have a system of medical training that produces the right number of doctors with the right skills to work in the right areas. Our doctors in training face an increasingly uncertain future. Medical graduate numbers are now at record highs, but too little planning went into expanding the opportunities for specialist training after internship. Workforce planning cannot be decided on the basis of the ambition of individual universities. While we have seen strong growth in vocational training places, it is not keeping pace with the number of graduates coming through. The bulge of pre-vocational doctors waiting to get onto a college training program is growing and it is only going to get worse. This has implications for not only the community's access to services, but the career aspirations and lives of some of our best and brightest. The government, finally, appears to have accepted the AMA's wisdom that we do not need any more medical students. This is an area where the AMA is doing a great deal of work providing real and practical policy solutions. We've lobbied for the National Medical Training Advisory Network to increase its modelling output and have a more robust role in workforce decision-making processes. We've also called for changes to migration settings to reduce the country's reliance on international medical graduates. IMGs have made a huge contribution to the medical workforce and to the AMA, but we must shift our policy focus to encouraging local graduates to work in the specialties and the locations where they are needed. The newly established role of Rural Health Commissioner will also help guide the implementation of the National Rural Generalist Training Pathway, a concept the AMA has supported strongly. While we obviously need to focus on expanding the number of postgraduate medical training places, it is important that we ensure the renowned quality of our medical training system is maintained. The decision by the Medical Board of Australia to take the lead on and implement a national training survey is a very welcome development. The idea of a national training survey is something the AMA Council of Doctors in Training first proposed several years ago. Our relentless advocacy on it means that it will soon come to fruition. This will be an important tool to support our doctors in training with the quality of their training and in tackling issues like workforce bullying and harassment. This year, the AMA produced two key report cards on two of the pillars of our health system, public hospitals and private health insurance. The AMA Public Hospital Report Card is the only report that presents core measures of hospital performance in a series over time. It's designed to reflect the experience of those of us who work in public hospitals. Our goal is simple, to draw national attention to the growing funding crisis facing public hospitals. Our hospitals are under ever increasing pressure to do more with less and less. With a new hospital funding agreement on the horizon, the 2017 report card was the beginning of a, of a push the AMA will need to make in coming years to secure a fairer deal from all governments. The Commonwealth and the jurisdictions both need to do better. The AMA private health insurance report card remains a key way for us to spark public debate about the value of private health insurance and work to better inform consumers about how health is really funded. Private health insurance is complex, unnecessarily complex, with thousands of options, varying levels of cover, and differing gaps and management expenses. 
We therefore use our national coverage to encourage consumers to read the fine print and search for a better deal from their insurer. But we also highlighted a few important points, facts often overlooked in the PHI debate. For example, benefits to doctors represent only 14% of hospital benefits paid out by insurers. We are not the affordability problem, particularly in an era of increasing profits for the listed private health insurers. Recent APRA figures show the industry recording a $1.3 billion profit, an 18% increase over the same time last year. We will continue to reinforce the right of patients to choose their doctor and where they receive their care. Private health insurance is about offering patients choice, not managing them down a path of reduced choices. We want consumers to be able to pick the right product for themselves and their families. The government has established a review to examine all aspects of private health insurance, and the AMA is at the table. While the stated goal of the committee is to develop easy to understand categories of health insurance, it has by necessity also looked into clinical definitions, contracting arrangements, and the information provided to consumers. Our lobbying has been backed up by many submissions, including to the ACCC, in their report to the Senate on anti-competitive behaviour. With an increasing focus on private patients in public hospitals, we will continue to highlight rights of private practice. We will strive to maintain flexible arrangements so that patients can choose to use their private health insurance in a public hospital, whether that's to have access to the right doctor, to the right facilities, or because they're a rural Australian and that's their only option. As you all know, the AMA works hard to represent and, where necessary, defend the rights of doctors. We must balance this with our role to ensure appropriate and ethical practice and call out inappropriate behaviour where we see it. That is why we continue to engage with APRA and the Medical Board of Australia, working to see improvements in the time taken to deal with notifications, to improve the process for communicating to practitioners and to push back on issues like non-medical board chairs. We also pushed hard against the undercooked revalidation proposal regarding risk to patients and poorly performing doctors, fighting the highly concerning effects that complaints and mandatory notifications have on doctors' health. We called out the ludicrous situation where COAG set up a 12-member maternity services framework without a single obstetrician or a single GP. We must do better for women and their babies. Even with the extra spending in the last budgets, there is no doubt in my mind that the drive for savings will need to continue in a number of policy areas. We saw in December a reduction in funding towards the federally funded indemnity schemes, along with the announcement of a review. And no one need tell an obstetrician gynaecologist the perils of uncertainty in indemnity. It remains a significant, sometimes massive, business expense for members. We cannot risk the care afforded to women and babies by crawling this area, nor see it affect any other area of medical practice. We've stated categorically any further changes to the schemes need to be considered as part of the review with consultation and in light of a full understanding of the fraught history of medical indemnity in this country. The AMA maintains its advocacy on Indigenous health. Today is National Sorry Day. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the referendum called by the Holt Government. This year marks the 20th anniversary of the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association. In November, we launched the AMA's Indigenous Health Report Card on rheumatic heart disease. This report card was a very significant piece of work and it led to the AMA becoming a foundation member of the End RHD Coalition. I'm pleased to see that our collective advocacy saw a $15 million allocation in this year's budget for RHD prevention. We continue the important work of the AMA Task Force on Indigenous Health that I chair. The AMA is also a member of the Close the Gap Steering Committee and a signatory to the Redfern Statement. The past year has also seen a record number of new position statements in the public health arena approved by Federal Council and publicly launched. I have to quickly run through them, but a revised position statement on obesity, a new position statement on autism spectrum disorder, which I launched with my predecessor, Professor Brian Aller and Autism Awareness Australia, a new position statement on fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, FASD, a new position statement on female genital mutilation. Our position statement on firearms certainly got a bit of attention. It went off, as they say. 
our position statement on bloodborne viruses and our call for an Australian National Centre for Disease Control continue to receive support and attention. And just last weekend, we released the position statement on marriage equality, which attracted substantial national and international attention. Its impact is still resonating today. We joined with the Academy of Science to relaunch the Science of Immunisation Questions and Answers booklet. I've been very vocal on the issue of child and adult vaccination, supporting research, taking on the anti-vaxxer movement, the occasional celebrity chef, the occasional political party leader, and supporting the government's no jab, no pay policy. Yesterday, the AMA Federal Council resolved to encourage moves towards a no-fault compensation scheme for that very small number of patients injured by vaccines. We regularly promoted our policies on climate change and health within Australia. Through the World Medical Association, we have taken advocacy on this issue to the global stage. We've continued to work behind the scenes with the Chief Medical Officer of Australian Border Force to support asylum seekers and refugees where there is evidence of inadequate health care. And the AMA has been strong in supporting the health care of those in custodial settings, including our direct representations to the government on prisoner access to Medicare and the PBS. One area of advocacy I had a strong interest and involvement in was the review of the AMA policy on euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide. After an extensive review process lasting over 12 months, we updated our policy in November. Ultimately, the AMA reaffirmed its position that doctors should not be involved in interventions that have as their primary intention the ending of a person's life. Beyond the debate regarding the legalisation of euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide, the position statement contains a clear message that doctors will never abandon their patients or the wider community, whatever the legal landscape. Patients who are suffering or dying can be assured that doctors will always be there to care for them until the end. Another important piece of work was the review of the AMA's Code of Ethics, the first major review in 10 years. The updated code provides ethical guidance to doctors in their relationships with patients, colleagues, other healthcare professionals and society. Additions to the updated code include specific guidance on those patients with impaired or limited decision-making capacity, relationships with family members and carers, bullying and harassment. More explicit guidance is provided on issues such as consent, conscientious objection, managing complaints, professional boundaries, managing interests, stewardship and protecting others from harm. In closing, I must say it has been a huge honour to serve the AMA and the medical profession in the first year of my presidency. The job is demanding, challenging, rewarding, it's life-changing. The issues, the experiences, the depth and breadth of policy and ideas and the interface with our political leaders are unique to this job. The responsibility is immense. The payback is the knowledge you can achieve great things for the AMA members, the whole medical profession and most importantly, the community, our patients. I thank you for your support, confidence and friendship. The AMA is a wonderful organisation that does many good things for many people. To Greg Hunt, I promised you the first time we spoke that I would be constructive. We will disagree as often as we agree, but health policy is too important to not get it right more often than not. I would like to give special thanks to some key people for helping me get through a hectic first year. My Vice President, Dr Tony Bartoni, for your consistent support and especially for your help with the heavy media workload. I will note that it is still another 127 days until Eastern Daylight Saving starts again. I wish it was longer. <laughs> My predecessor, Brian Aller, for leaving a positive agenda to progress. The Federal Council, the Board and the Secretariat, led so capably by Secretary-General Anne Trimmer for all the work and effort behind the scenes. To the State and Territory AMAs for their teamwork. But I'll tell you, this is often a very lonely job and I would like to single out two Federal councillors who are unflinching in their loyalty, support and work ethic. Dr Andrew Miller, AMA WA President, and Dr Chris Moy, Chair of the Ethics and Medico-Legal Committee. Finally, thank you to my wife, Mariam, and our two darling children, Kira and Patrick, who are at school at home in Perth today. Um, thank you for letting me do the job. That means I spend so much time away from home and away from you, which is not always that much fun. But I do it on behalf of all the other dads and mums that care about what happens to the people they love when they are sick, hurt, scared, needy or dying. 
It is an amazing honour to be your president. I hope that we can all work together to build on our successes in my second year. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to now introduce the Minister for Health, Greg Hunt. Greg was elected as Federal Member for Flinders in 2001 and became a Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Environment and Heritage and then Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Foreign Affairs as a young MP in the Howard Government. Greg was Shadow Minister for the Environment between 2007 and 2013 and then Minister for the Environment between 2013 and 2016. In 2016, he was selected as the inaugural Best Minister in the World at the World Government Summit. Greg was appointed Minister for Industry, Innovation and Science in July 2016. In January 2017, Greg was appointed Minister for Health and Minister for Sport, an appropriate and fitting double for the Best Minister in the World. Greg is serious about sport. As a competitor and a fan, he goes for Richmond. Um, oh, no one laughed, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> and is equally serious about his own fitness. He's chalked up seven marathons and is known to enjoy the occasional 500 kilometre walk around his electorate for charity. Greg was born and raised on the beautiful Mornington Peninsula and lives there today with his wife Paula and two young children. He's been engaging, consultative and approachable as health minister and has a deep interest in the portfolio, possibly helped by the fact that both his wife and mother are nurses. Please welcome the Minister for Health, the Honourable Greg Hunt. Look, thank you very much to, uh, to Michael. I, I have to say, my first call after uh, the Prime Minister uh, rang me and uh, offered me the current role was, in fact, to, to Michael Gannon. Um, I didn't realise how he dressed in his private time, and uh, he hasn't taught me the secret handshake yet. But uh, ever since that moment, Michael and I have spoken perhaps uh, every week and often once or twice a day. From time to time, I may not have been immediately available because of parliamentary duties, and from time to time, he may not have been immediately available. And I've remembered on a couple of occasions, he's got back to me and said, look, I'm sorry about that, I was delivering a baby. And I said, that's fine. Uh, at the end of the day, whilst he's the president of the AMA, uh, he said to me that his most important roles are as uh, a dad and husband on the one hand, and as a, a working doctor, uh, helping mothers bring new babies into the world. And it, it puts all our roles into perspective, that the role of the doctor, whether it's the, the GP or the specialist, is ultimately and fundamentally about giving people the best chance at a healthier life, a longer life, a better life, a more confident life. And when I talked to my wife and uh, in earlier days when my mother was with us, when I talked to my mother, although each of them was convinced that they were in charge of uh, the operating theatres in their time and not the doctors, uh, they have immense and deep and profound respect for the doctors with whom they have worked over so many years. So I want to just acknowledge, Michael, you and your work, uh, both as president of the AMA but above all else, as a doctor involved in the great task of life, uh, and then all of the members of the AMA here for your commitment to your profession, but the general community in particular. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, Tony Bartroni. Uh, I've dealt with Tony on, on many matters uh, and, and his work. Uh, uh, Beverly Robotham, uh, who's here and uh, chairing the, uh, the council. Uh, Anne Trimmer as Secretary General, who's been a tremendous partner for engagement on policy issues on a on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, uh, previous presidents, I understand, I think, uh, at least I'm aware that uh, Dr Brian Owler is here and Mukesh Haikawal, uh, and we, along with Michael Gannon, have been discussing an issue that I'll come back to later, which is uh, mental health 
and support for the medical workforce themselves because too often um, the care is not there for the carers. I think that's an extremely important point of partnership and your reference to, to Chloe's tragedy is something that, uh, that I want to address. Uh, and then I also uh, want to acknowledge Dr Anthony DiDio. Anthony is uh, my local GP when I'm in, in Canberra. He does make house calls, I've discovered. And uh, he, uh, when I had a, uh, uh, an issue with uh, a mysterious sort of uh, leg and illness uh, issue after coming back from China in, in uh, December, uh, he discovered and interpreted that I'd picked up a little golden staph uh, infection through a cut in the toe and had me admitted. And uh, uh, I, I want to say, Anthony, uh, you are an outstanding doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, but I understand doctors are not allowed to advertise, so that was not a paid advertisement. Uh, let, let me begin in a different place. Uh, I want to go back to where I was a week ago at almost exactly this time. Uh, I was in the uh, intensive care new unit of the neonatal ward at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney. And there we were introduced to the parents, to the... Uh, doctors, the nurses, and the, the little premature 28 and 29 week olds that were the subject of this amazing unit. And these children would not have been there but for the extraordinary capacity of the medical profession. And in fact, the whole notion, in my view, of society comes together in an ICU, in a neonatal ward, in a major public hospital. Our family was touched, uh, Michael, in a similar way a decade ago. My now 10-year-old nephew was born at 28 weeks and he was cared for by doctors here in Melbourne at the, uh, uh, at the women's and then at the uh, Royal Children's and they saw him through his early journey. And so there would be doctors in this room uh, and doctors in other rooms who helped to take care of my little nephew, Alessandro. And again, I saw those learnings being translated as we, uh, a decade on last week, where new life was being given new hope. And you should, every day, stop and have a little moment to think that what I am engaged in as a doctor is the most noble of professions. And I just want to acknowledge that before looking at the policy issues that what I saw last week and what our family saw a decade ago is the absolute definition of society at its best. So I thank you for that in particular. Now, looking forwards in terms of the health profession, uh, my view and our view uh, as a government is that we have one of the best health systems in the world, but our vision is that we can take it to be unequivocally with all of the resources, human capital uh, and societal that we have in Australia, the best health system in the world. That is the vision. So in order to do that, the fundamental thing that we want to uh, set out is a long-term national health plan and to work together towards that outcome. Uh, the AMA, along with the, uh, uh, the GPs, the pharmacists uh, and the, uh, the medicines or pharmaceutical sector has been a fundamental partner in that process. So what we have set out in the long-term national health plan is four critical pillars. Firstly, guaranteeing and supporting Medicare and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and strengthening it in particular through working with our medical workforce. Uh, secondly, is the focus, uh, as Michael set out, uh, of supporting the hospital system, the public hospitals, the private hospitals, and the private health insurance system. I think that hybrid combination is a fundamental part of the success, but also the challenges that the Australian system faces. Thirdly, is prioritising mental health and preventive health. And fourthly, is medical research. And only yesterday, uh, along with Professor Ann Kelso and uh, Professor Bruce Robinson and Ian Fraser and so many uh, Australian luminaries, we announced the new guidelines developed by the medical research profession for the medical research sector 
for the NH and MRC going forward. So let me begin uh, with, uh, in particular, the guaranteeing and supporting of Medicare and the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, which was such a fundamental part of the overall budget package, which was a, a new investment of more than $10, uh, $10 billion in the health system. But it's not the number, it's the partnerships that we struck and the agreed priorities. Central to those partnerships was what we did with the AMA, and um, I know that Michael and many others worked exceptionally hard on this. The shared vision statement, which we jointly issued, sets out a commitment to transparency in health, to re-indexation, to support for reforms, and then uh, to the fundamental independence and role of, uh, of the AMA. As part of that, the achievements uh, which we were able to deliver, and I've got to say that you know, Michael and Anne together are uh, very, very tough negotiators. They took us to places that I never thought we'd get to when we started, um, but uh, in that context, you are very well represented, no question about it. Uh, firstly, obviously, there's the billion dollars that we were able to add for reindexation over the next four years. Secondly, as part of that, something that Michael made clear, I think, from our very first conversation, was the notion that controlling of doctors' rents was not an acceptable proposition, that there had to be a better way to support both pathology and the medical, uh, medical community of specialists and GPs. And so we worked hard and we found a solution to that. The solution was that we would uh, support the continued bulk billing incentive for pathology and diagnostic imaging in return for not controlling doctor's rents. And personally, I have to say that at a, at a, a philosophical level, I was very happy with that outcome. I think it was the right balance and the right outcome to make sure that there's compliance against the law, but that this notion that we could have in some way, shape or form, controlled rents for doctors uh, has been now put aside, and I would say it's been put aside forever. Uh, at the same time, we were able to protect the Medicare safety net to abandon some of those initiatives which had been put forward in 2014. I think they had been tried, and uh, on in my time, on my watch, it was our view that now was the moment to put them behind us. The same with the attempts to uh, make changes to the bulk billing incentives for pathology and diagnostic imaging, they have been, uh, they've been rejected. Uh, and so all of that has meant that we've had a reinvestment in Medicare, more generally, of $2.4 billion, uh, and that has allowed us to work with the AMA and with the GPs uh, on a much broader package of reform and reinvestment. Uh, Michael has talked at length about the MBS review, and my approach there is we have the medical uh, experts work with the medical experts on finding what are the ways forward to ensure that we are always looking to improve uh, the list of items to make sure that they are relevant, and there are no surprises that everything we do is a process of continued consultation and that it's done by the professionals with the professionals. S uh, similarly, uh, we were able to strike agreement uh, not just with the AMA but with every state on an opt-in, uh, 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 sorry, an opt-out uh, procedure for the first time for the My Health Record. Now, uh, why does this matter? It means that we will go from about 4.7 million uh, records currently to 23 million records is, is roughly the number where I think it will land within about 24 months. What does that mean? It means that we will have the capacity for some of the best health data analytics in the world. And that means that we will be able to do preventive health on a national basis on an utterly in an utterly informed way. But the great challenge is the issue of ensuring that it works for the medical workforce. And so now that we go into a strong, clear consultative period over the, uh, the next few months on real incentives to assist the medical workforce in their work, whether it's in 
the hospitals, whether it's for the specialists, whether it's for the GPs, in the right incentives to ensure that that, uh, and the right design to ensure that the record actually serves your purposes. So I want it to be designed by doctors, for doctors, so as to assist patients with their lifetime records, but also to assist against adverse drug reactions, uh, to assist in emergency situations where time is so critical, so as it becomes fundamental to the ability of doctors to conduct their work in a timely fashion and get better health outcomes. That's the only test of success. Is it being used and is it providing better health outcomes? And so our task now is to assist with the right incentives to do that. The next thing uh, going forwards is, uh, Michael has also mentioned the Healthcare Homes Trial. Uh, we had more than 400 applications from, for 200 places. We listened to the AMA on the right timing. Um, I want to look at this as a trial, but I am aware, and I think uh, what you've said to me, Michael, in, in private as well as public, is this is, uh, in theory, it's an outcomes payment, but perhaps we, we can and should be moving to a much more genuine outcomes payment in the healthcare homes model. And I think you know, contained within that, uh, I'm flexible and willing to look at those items. I think that this is a trial. I'm not saying it's the end of it. I think we can improve the model that is there, which is exactly what uh, the AMA and the, uh, the GPs have been saying to us. Going forwards, um, one of the fundamental elements uh, is what we've also been able to do with the Medicines Australia Agreement and the support for the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. If you look at the challenges in health over successive governments over many, many years, much of it emanates from the epicentre of the PBS. The great, great trend of history is that new medicines are being developed all of the time to deal with extraordinary conditions. And I know in, in my time we've been able to extend the listing of Kaleidico for cystic fibrosis for these beautiful young children, ages two to six, with transformative benefits, something though which would have cost families $300,000 and more per year, something completely beyond the reach of, of any but the very, very few in society. Uh, we've been able to assist uh, with uh, drugs for, for lung cancer, uh, for ovarian cancer and so many other life-threatening conditions. But these drugs have come at a, a huge cost to the system. That's what we should be doing. And historically, much of the space for that has been made in other areas. That's, of course, how ultimately the indexation pause in, uh, laid down in uh, early uh, 2013 came about uh, because of making space for new drugs. The agreement with Medicines Australia addresses that problem for the first time. They were willing to accept lower prices for the listed uh, Formula One drugs um, and lower prices in the transition from Formula One to Formula Two of $1.8 billion over five years. So a very significant reduction in return for the guarantee that for the first time we would create genuine headroom, a space for new listings. And what that does is it's very important for the drugs but in particular, it protects the rest of the health budget in Australia. So we see that the Medicare uh, budget will go from 23 to 24 to 26 to 28 billion dollars over the next over the next four years, and we've been able to protect that by the changes that have been made with the Medicines Australia Agreement. And similarly, the agreement uh, with the Pharmacy Guild, which in particular is predicated on the uh, uh, on the ability to make savings through their dispensing processes has also allowed us to reinvest in that sector. So anything that we've done is allowing for the full reinvestment. That's the theory behind the, the four critical areas of agreements with uh, the uh, specialists, with the doctors, uh, with the pharmacists and with the medicines providers in the country. So uh, it's the first time that there's been simultaneous agreements, I'm advised, uh, ever, and it's a real tribute to the work of the AMA in helping to lead that process. That then leads me to the second 
of our pillars, which is the support for hospitals. In this budget, we were, uh, we were fortunate to be able to invest an additional $2.8 billion uh, in supporting the public hospital network in Australia. And that brings in just the last uh, 16 months, the total additional support to $7.7 .7 billion. So what we can see is that the public hospital funding grows from 19 to 20 to 21 to $22 billion over the, the course of the next four years. And that allows for new treatments and in particular for work on reducing waiting lists. At the same time, we also want to be working on the private health insurance and the way in which there, we can help take pressures out of the costs. We've just had the lowest cost increase in 10 years. However, it's still too high. And one of the major tasks that I have over the next 12 months is helping to reduce pressures on uh, private health insurance premiums. I think that that's a, a fundamental and joint role that we will work on together. Then uh, beyond the hospitals, there's the critical work of uh, mental health and preventive health. One of the major initiatives in the, in the budget was prioritising mental health. For the first time, this has been raised uh, to the top level as one of the four pillars of the national uh, long-term national health plan. And we were able to invest significantly in mental health both in the election but in particular in the, in the budget as well. There's a very strong focus on suicide prevention with support for suicide prevention hotspots uh, uh, and a, an $11 million initiative, but also complementing that with the rural telehealth initiative for psychological services. Much of this is deeply important preventive health work. Uh, on the mental health side. And it, it goes with what has to happen in, I think, the medical workforce. The, the case of Chloe Abbott were, was outlined, and I'm aware that many people have been affected by Chloe's loss, as well as others. And uh, Michael and I have been speaking this week. I've also been speaking uh, in recent weeks with, uh, with Mukesh Haikawal. And I am determined, Michael, to offer a partnership with uh, the government and the AMA for us to provide new investment directly into caring for carers. And so I want to announce that uh, we will offer a partnership going forward and uh, we will develop the uh, suicide prevention and mental health programs with the AMA and the, the broader medical workforce uh, for suicide prevention and mental health support specifically for doctors and other medical workforce professionals. Uh, one of the critical roles that, uh, that you have is psychosocial services that uh, there's the clinical work with those with mental health issues, but then there is the support services. The NDIS is a, it's a wonderful national initiative with great bipartisan support. Uh, one of the gaps within it, though, is that as services were being passed into the NDIS for psychosocial support, there was an emerging risk that those outside would, fire, uh, would be left without adequate support. So we've invested $80 million in this budget, and it's something I've been fortunate to work on with Pat McGorry, with Jackie Crow, with Ian Hickey, uh, with Lucy Brogdon, and so many of the others in, this, in the sector. That, I think, is critical. We've made it contingent on matching funding from the states. Uh, I've written to all of the states, but I'm very confident that they will match it. And so, instead of a gap, we'll have our 80 plus 80 from the states, which will really help strengthen up this area going forwards. Moving from mental health to preventive health, the obesity epidemic is real and undeniable. It's in all areas of society. Uh, it starts in childhood. So it's something which is a real passion for both the Prime Minister and myself. We have provided funding uh, to get people moving for physical activity as well as to ensure that the GPs have a national healthy weight partnership. Um, the physical activity is a partnership of $10 million with the Heart Foundation, and that's to get 300,000 people who otherwise might be at risk 
uh, of uh, diabetes, obesity, walking, both at school, at youth, and at all ages uh, levels. So we, that's a new initiative which we've just launched, and we launched that also at, Royal, uh, at, uh, at St Vincent's uh, in Sydney a couple of weeks ago with the, uh, with the Prime Minister. But there's a, a much broader range of activities on that front. Sports, participation, both exercise and competitive. Uh, cancer screening, where there's a $150 million initiative, in particular breast cancer uh, screening as well as cervical cancer. Uh, support for prostate uh, cancer nurses and support uh, for mental health nurses. So the, these are some of the things that we're doing on the preventive front. All of that leads me to the last of the areas, uh, which is medical research. As I mentioned at the, out, uh, at the outset, yesterday uh, we were able to announce the new uh, National Health and Medical Research Council uh, program uh, structures developed by the medical research community. All up, uh, we're now on track to double medical research over the next five years. This is the golden moment in Australian medical research funding. The Medical Research Future Fund will match the National Health and, uh, and Medical Re Research Council's work and funding. Uh, we have just announced uh, that uh, it will be a total of $1.4 billion over the next four years, with growing from 60 to uh, 120 to 220 to 380 to 640 million, so growing on an annual basis at a very rapid rate. Importantly, as part of that, in our first round of announcements, one of the issues which the medical profession has raised with us is antimicrobial resistance. It's not just a concern for us, but in the current discussions uh, before the World Health Organization, we know that it's a global concern. Uh, as we've been successful against, uh, in our uh, antimicrobial work, we've also seen resistance. And the prescription of drugs to achieve things has meant that nature has responded with a counter-reaction. So that's a real battle. T today, I'm announcing $5.9 million to be made available for research under the Medical Research Future Fund for combating antimicrobial resistance. We have to find ways of identifying, addressing and responding to the emerging superbugs. Uh, this risk is... Uh, an enormous risk for popul uh, population health, not just in Australia and in the, uh, but in the developed and the developing world. So we are part of a global push, which is coming out of the World Health Organization, and it's something that I've discussed with them and with the AMA. Going forwards, um, there are three waves that we're trying to deliver these uh, these reforms. Firstly. Uh, this budget has delivered on the first wave. The fundamental agreements on Medicare and the PBS go, uh, uh, with the profession, the partnership with the uh, AMA in the form of the shared vision as well as with the GPs, the Medicines Australia uh, members and with the Pharmacy Guild. The mental health investments that are part of that as well. The second wave now is about the workforce issues which Michael has outlined, we now go into 12 months of very careful design, which can only be done in complete consultation with the profession about the right understanding of the challenges and the right mechanisms to ensure that there is a very healthy GP uh, rural, uh, rural generalist pathway, but that we have the right balance of future workforce in terms of uh, GPs and specialists, urban and rural. At the same time, we'll be focusing on the sustainability of private health insurance and the aged care system and delivering on the fifth national mental health and suicide prevention plan. Then the third wave of what we want to do, um, which uh, will be delivered over the next two years, is the great challenge of turning avoidable hospital admissions into avoided hospital admissions. This is preventive health care in its deepest sense. It's probably the most fundamental challenge for us to work on, and it's ensuring that we provide the right incentives, the real incentives, so as doctors are uh, provided with incentives and rewards 
for delivering the outcomes that keep people out of our hospitals. That's important for sustainability, but above all else, it's important for the health of individuals and the population at large. And with that, looking at the extraordinary challenge going forwards and the opportunity provided by uh, genomics and precision medicine, which will continue to transform medicine and health in Australia. Ultimately, I want to thank you, I want to honour you, and I want to congratulate you on your contribution uh, as doctors, as carers, and as people who make a profound difference to the lives of Australians every single day. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the Honourable Greg Hunt for, uh, for his speech and those new announcements. Uh, there are obviously uh, numerous areas in which uh, we look forward to uh, engaging positively. Uh, I'm going to start the introduction uh, for our next uh, speaker. I think uh, he's, uh, he's probably heard it before, but uh, our next speaker uh, is a politician with a deep interest in health policy and a great appreciation of how influential health can be in election outcomes. Opposition leader Bill Shorten promoted health policy relentlessly at the last election and came very close to victory because of it. Having joined the Labor Party at the age of 17 and devoting his working life to the Labor movement, Bill worked first as a union organiser, union secretary and then on the ACTU executive. He was first elected as the member for Maribyrnong at the 2007 federal election. Bill was quickly sworn into the Labor Ministry in 2010 and promoted to Cabinet in 2011. As a senior member of the Labor government, Bill played a key role in Labor reforms such as disability care and increasing universal superannuation to 12%. He has an enduring interest in social justice issues such as domestic violence and equal opportunity at work. He served as Assistant Treasurer, Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, and Minister for Education. Bill Shorten was elected leader of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party and leader of the opposition in October 2013. Bill likes to keep fit and can be regularly seen out for a jog. He may well be jogging now, uh, possibly looking up for a call up to his beloved pies. Maybe they need him. Uh, he lives in his Maribyrnong electorate with his wife, Chloe, and their three children. Uh, I've particularly uh, enjoyed my interactions with the opposition leader. I found him to be uh, extremely warm and engaging with a, with a detailed uh, knowledge of the health portfolio. Um, he gave a fabulous uh, speech at the launch of the uh, ALP Health Summit, which I attended uh, uh, recently. Um, I, I'm not getting any signals to say that, uh, uh, that uh, he's, he, he is here. He's good, okay. All right, please welcome the Opposition Leader, the Honourable Bill Shorten. The opposition leader's not here, so. <laughs> anyway, there's a chance for you all to pause and take in the announcements from the minister. Uh, it's, I'm not going to ask for any unsolicited questions for the floor. That could be dangerous. <laughs> no, I want Antonio, come and tell us a joke. <laughs>
All right, so I told you that, um, uh, that um, Bill likes to keep fit, but I think his jog is just nearly finished. Um, I would like you all to uh, uh, join with me in welcoming the Opposition Leader, the Honourable Bill Shorten. All right, as, you, as you can say, we're, uh, we're, we're ticking like a well-oiled machine here today. Down, isn't it? <laughs> Good morning, everybody, and thank you for inviting me. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. It's actually this last fortnight been a, a historic milestone has been commemorated for all Australians, in particular our first Australians. Some of you may be aware that it's just 20 years this week that the uh, landmark report 20 years ago with the Bringing Them Home report told the truth about the stolen generations. It's 25 years this week since Eddie Marbo's famous victory in the High Court which established the case for native title in this country. And I think that when we talk about anniversaries, it's the 50th anniversary since nine out of 10 of our fellow Australians voted yes in a referendum to, at long last, count Aboriginal people in the census. And it empowered, I believe, the Commonwealth to get on and do more to help challenge the inequality and injustice that first Australians received. So this is a good week, anniversaries. They remind us of what you can do when you fight. They remind us of what we can do as a nation when we aim to be better rather than just the status quo. Of course, though, in celebrating these milestones, and for many of you who work with Indigenous Australians, you don't need to be reminded of this next point. It reminded the parliament in which I'm privileged to serve of the unfinished business of reconciliation. Not just important questions of historical justice, but current issues, constitutional recognition, but also the nitty gritty of tackling disadvantage. And I think that nothing is more fundamental, nothing more important in closing the gap in terms of the quality and standard of life of our first Australians and other Australians than closing the gap in terms of health outcomes. And I do want to commend the AMA. I want to thank you and your members for all of the work you do, much of which isn't reported, but without which progress could not be made. You know that there's a long way to travel. We live in a marvellous country, it's a first world country, but when Aboriginal people are still losing their sight to trachoma, a third world disease, we can do better. The fact that our first Australians are still grappling with kidney failure, with infant mortality rates, a life expectancy far inferior to non-Indigenous Australians, then we still have a long way to go. And I have to say that the commitment of AMA, of members of the AMA, of health professionals in this country, I think is fundamental, irreplaceable to the integrity of our journey towards reconciliation. And talking about inequality, something which doesn't always get the play it deserves in the mainstream media, I want to congratulate you for leading in the powerful statement you made about marriage equality last week. Now I know that not everyone would have agreed, not every AMA member may have agreed, and I know there is a lot of heat, a lot of passion in this debate. But what I thought that you did is you, with your statement, was even more forceful than some of the arguments that are pursued. Because yours was measured, it was considered, it was evidence-based, it was matter of fact. You just addressed the consequences of discrimination on mental health. 
You made it clear, though, that gay parents in every way are equally capable of raising happy, resilient, confident kids in loving households. I know it got some media coverage at the time, and I can't imagine these deliberations are easy, even if you are as rational and as calm as possible, cool as a cucumber. There will still be some people in any organisation will say that was far too hot-headed and tempestuous. I just thought it was a valuable addition in a debate which all too often gets distorted by the extremes. The other point I want to make about that, before I come to the main part of my address on healthcare, is that you in this organisation and at this gathering, you are privileged to be leaders. And whilst this statement you made mightn't be something which is front of mind for every one of your members. What you've done is you made a decision and you led. And what I've learnt when I've been privileged to lead is it's not the times that you follow which you tend to remember as you progress, it's the times when you made the hard decisions, the times when you choose to lead. It's a funny thing about leadership, you can do 99% of what you do every day and quite frankly, Someone else could probably do it, maybe not as well, quite as well. But sometimes you get to moments in organisations when you just do something which but for you doing it, it wouldn't have otherwise happened. And that's what I think an important element of leadership is. And so now in turning to the issue of how health policy tracks in this country, you know that Labor made Medicare and health policy a very important part of the last general election. I hope you appreciate that it wasn't something that we had constructed in the two months before. The Labor's history of commitment to Medicare, accessible, affordable, quality health care is part of the DNA of the party that I'm privileged to lead. It's part of the DNA which makes Catherine King, who's here today, such a great shadow health minister. It's something which we fundamentally believe in. We've created it. Whitlam tried it first, Fraser rolled it back. Hawke and Keating then introduced Medicare. And just so we don't forget the history, on nine different times in federal elections, our political opponents have opposed Medicare. John Howard put an end to that towards the end of the 90s. And we thought that the debates about proper and bipartisan funding of healthcare, we thought that that was the new world that we were in. So therefore, the policy we took at the last election was the product of extensive consultation, a lot of conversations with the AMA and its members. And again now, we are again, as an opposition, working on updating and improving our social and economic policies. We're out talking to the experts, which clearly includes people in this room. I said in January uh, this year, the Labor was treating 2017 as a year of preparation and that I would make meeting with health professionals and clinicians a huge part of that. We came close at the last election, but I think the best thing we can do is listen to the electorate, who had plenty of advice, I think, for all sides of politics. We intend to have positive policies at the next election which reflect the hard preparation and the hard work of opposition. I'm very pleased that the AMA played such an active role in the National Health Summit that we convened in March of this year. But I've also tried to make an effort to get out to the suburbs and the regions of this country. I put a lot of stock in uh, the American-style town hall meetings. You get out and you talk to people. More importantly, you listen to people. And you let people ask you questions rather than you just preach from the pulpit. I think that in a big and diverse nation such as Australia, that this is fundamental to improving people's confidence in politics. But one thing I know in every one of my town hall meetings I've done, I've done about 50. Anyone can come. No one has stopped coming. If you're a protester, you get to stand up the back. You put your sign up. You can put your possum suit on or whatever the cause. It's all good. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that happens in every town hall meeting. Questions on health care are always foremost. There are questions from the quality of aged care to the challenges of mental health. Health care is an issue which all Australians think about but I'm hardly telling you something you didn't know. But when you think about the common afflictions which are afflicting this nation, I hear most often about ice and mental health, and of course where to find an older parent or grandparent, dignified care. 
But you hear about the communities under pressure. You hear in the regions the lack of access to specialist services. You hear the stories of GPs, single GPs, at stretching point. They can't take any more patients. And what is going to happen with the quality of healthcare going forward? It's on the minds of parents. It's on the minds of all Australians. And of course, you've got the profound challenge of suicide. And we will certainly study the announcement of the government today. And uh, if it's a good one, we're certainly not going to stand in the way and we'll be very supportive. But what I know, and I guess you know from the patients you see, is that it takes a lot of effort to talk about these issues. There's always people who say, what more can be done? I don't take the proposition that more can't be done in healthcare, that somehow near enough is good enough. I think that when we look at the challenges, the other challenge I hear is frustration with private health insurance. Uh, a decade ago, 8% of private health insurance policies had some form of exclusion. Now it's over 38%. People are frustrated with the system. To be honest, they're by and large happy with their doctors, but they're frustrated with the system, the clunkiness, the waiting times. They're frustrated also with cost. So in doing this of talking to the people, I've also been talking to the people at the front line of our health system. I've had the opportunity, I'm grateful to people including some in this room who've attended nearly 20 of our specialist round tables in the last six months. GPs, emergency room staff, nurses, specialists. I find it's an excellent way to gain insight into the national challenges. I think there is a hunger in the healthcare industry for, for continuity for a sense of a longer term plan, not the constant chopping and changing. There is a desire to talk about how we can imp improve health by preventing problems and by investing in primary care, not just leaving it to the hospital system. There are recurring messages too I hear from our specialists. The need to invest in the first thousand days of life. That can determine the health of a whole generation. There is of course the need to do better by Australians in their fourth quarter the fastest growing part of our population and the biggest users of our hospital system. There are challenges in aged care as well as in health care. And then of course we've got the challenges of those soul destroying afflictions such as dementia or Alzheimer's. And of course then people talk to me amongst the medical profession about the bigger test of the quality of life. Too many of our older Australians end up in a hospital bed, not because it's the best option, but because there is no other option. And this is true with families of loved ones who are dealing with mental affliction or indeed diseases of addiction. The crisis care is there, but the subacute places, the support beyond the first flash of emergency, that is very hard to find and all too often it requires people leaving regions and local areas to go elsewhere, which as you know, makes the chances of people actually uh, using these services all that much harder. There are not enough meaningful incentives, I understand, in our system to support GPs to sustainably work in aged care, meaning that patients end up in hospitals rather than the care where they live. There's a lack of access to decent palliative care services, especially for those who would like to receive care at that stage in their life in their own homes. And of course, despite the rapid increases in demand, we need to do much more to train and support nursing staff for aged care facilities. Everywhere I go, I hear different stories with a familiar theme. Gaps in the system, breakdowns in communication, and too much time and scarce resources consumed by inefficiencies. I get that we have a system which pays doctors for the number of times they see patients. I get that we have a system which puts its incentives in the volume. But what we need to do is to have a system which allows the focus on the overall needs of the patient rather than a system which provides incentives by the number of times a GP sees a patient. And of course, the whole challenge in terms of disconnections when patients receive treatment from different people in their health, in their health journey. When patients present at emergency departments, it isn't right that there isn't a better system of liaising with the person's individual GP. And if they don't have an electronic health record, the registrar will often have to take the patient through their full case history. You know how time consuming that is, and you know how the double and multiple handling just makes it harder. And that's providing the patients in the position to be able to give you all of that information. And sometimes we hear of the GPs who don't even find 
for their patients be to a hospital and discharge until weeks afterwards and the forms are, forms are sent out. This must be a system which drives trained professionals to the point of frustration. The paperwork, the duplication, and it takes up valuable time. And there's that very human cost of doctors who have to apply analytical skills and empathy to every new patient. For every bad experience, and I think this is important, for every bad experience of the system an individual patient has, GPs have to live that 100 times over. And the work you do is already very complex. It is a challenge for us in policy to how do we avoid, on one hand, layering complexity, and on the other hand, achieving accountability. I do not see, though, the role of government as to stand between you and the patient. That helps no one. I think our focus should be on supporting mechanisms that work best for you and the patients. I think we have to break down this idea of a unit cost situation. The system, as I said, where you get paid for when you see the patient, irrespective of whether or not that's the best use of time. I think we have to embrace more of a team approach letting GPs work with nurses and allied health staff to get the best outcomes for patients. I think obviously the same can be said for the integration of specialists, obviously and especially for the one in five Australians with multiple chronic diseases. Now the point about all of this though is you probably didn't need me to tell you that. You understand the problems. But what we need is a parliament, not just Liberal, not just Labor, but a parliament that understands what's happening and can lend meaningful support. We don't need blockages for his stubbornness or a stubborn belief that the Commonwealth knows best. We're already seeing practices everywhere doing data from what were Medicare locals, now primary health networks. And I think they are, on balance, delivering better and more tailored services to their community. I think about the practices which have high numbers of residents with diabetes. They're expanding to include the exercise physiologists, the diabetes educators, the podiatrists, the endocrinologists into their clinics, putting new emphasis on nutrition and regular exercise. Nothing overly complicated, just healthy habits and positive reinforcement. I see the success of common sense community-based healthcare occurring right around Australia. And in large part, that's driven by the entrepreneurship and the expertise of our GPs. Doctors who are committed to the best outcomes for their patients and willing to go that extra distance to be able to coordinate their health care. But sometimes I think those success stories happy, happen in spite of our system, not because of our system. Now the AMA has a big responsibility in the health debate and where we want to go. There are not many organisations who can claim every single Australian as a stakeholder, but the AMA can. Health is a universal concern of all Australians, as we know. And Australians trust your members to care for the most precious thing in our lives, which is our health. For with that privilege comes, of course, a very deep and serious responsibility, not just in the daily lives of the people that your members see, but in the way that your association carries its arguments. For three years, the AMA has been at the forefront of opposing some of the attacks on Medicare. Your authenticity your conviction, your influence was felt in every corner of the country. And I have to say that as much as my political opponents said that the stories of our concerns about Medicare and the health system were concocted and capable of being put in on a 140, 140 character tweet, the fact of the matter is that after the election, the government seems to be at least aware of the importance of the issues of health care. I know, uh, as the health minister has said, that the government want to be many friends again. But today I want to submit to you the evidence of the last election. It was the last election, I submit, which has led to at least a rhetorical sea change in the government's words. Because this government was driven to an almost surprising defeat within one seat of losing its majority. I would submit to you, and it's just the evidence, regardless of how you voted on July the 2nd, the evidence is that the government nearly lost the last election, and one of the biggest issues for voters was the quality of the healthcare system in this country. So the AMA 
It wasn't taking a side. It was taking the side of patients. You had a tremendous significance, and healthcare had a centre stage role in the last election. But I would say to you, having accomplished that, that all of a sudden there is at least a consensus about the importance of healthcare in the political debate, I just ask you to exercise that same love of evidence in terms of the deal which the government's currently trying to pass off. I think you're entitled to ask, is the government tackling health care on the basis of a long-term commitment, properly funded to the future, of needs of patients, or is it trying to shut down what it sees as a political vulnerability? The full facts need to be examined. In the 2017 budget, which was uh, presented by the government two and a half weeks ago, indexation for GP and specialist consultations will come back in the middle of 2018. You assume that, that will con the, the next federal election will be after the middle of 2018. It won't be, however, until 2019 that this happens for some procedures and for 113 others, from mental health assistance to chronic disease management, the freeze will remain in place until the middle of 2020. In the meantime, since the government's been elected to now, the out-of-pocket costs of Medicare have already increased by 34% in the last three and a half years. So you all know that the rebate which GPs receive, which was frozen at $37.05 since December, doesn't allow for ongoing care and managing illness. So the problem with this system is that the costs for patients, the out-of-pockets, have gone up 34.5%. That's largely been found by patients, and to be honest, it's also been found by the medical profession, who perhaps have had to sort of absorb some of the increased costs of healthcare in this country. But it's definitely been a transfer from uh, the government to patients, and in some cases to your own profession. And we've got this system, which I said, has an incentive that the more patients you see, the more they get their rebate. But as you know, volume driven is not necessarily the same correlation as quality care. My concern is that the government's proposed measures, which I outlined, reversing freezes gradually over the next three years, doesn't really tackle the long-term future, and it doesn't recognise some of the difficulties which have occurred in the last three and a half years. So in preparation for today's event, which I take most seriously, we went to the Independent Parliamentary Budget Office. The government has the Treasury Department, but there's a Parliamentary Budget Office made up of economists and experts who actually cost what the government says, what we say, what the Greens say. Uh, uh, someone's got to. Um, OK, OK, sorry for those of you. Um, but this Parliamentary Budget Office, we went to them in preparation after the budget in preparation for today's meeting because I wanted to give you evidence which hasn't been put out before, and I wanted to see for myself how much is what I'm saying just because I don't vote Liberal and how much is what I'm saying based on the issues. So let me tell you, uh, the total reduction, if the, the difference between if indexation had been in to now, is that there's been, and if they had just simply indexed, removed all the freezes one July or on budget night, compared to what they're actually going to do, it's $3.2 billion light. So let me put that to you. The difference, if they had uh, taken away the freezes uh, at budget time over the next four years, would be an extra $3.2 billion in patient rebate. I understand, it wasn't about the GPs, it's about what the patients get. So there's $3.2 billion that the government could have put in, but they chose not to, and they've got other priorities. That's their choice. But the point about it is when we talk about that money, it's patient money. But the point about it is it's for services you provide. So if you like, the uh, amount of uh, available resource to our healthcare system is now going to have to be found by patients and by yourselves. That's $3.2 billion, but the government didn't put in. So the impact this year is $735 million. Now some people say, but the government did make some tweaks this year. They did. $9 million. 
So when we look at, and I'm not talking about all the other health policies, they are as they are, but you know, Medicare is at the heart of our system. Instead of reversing their freezes, or unfreezing, which uh, would have added $735 million available for patients, they've given $9 million. And no one's heard those numbers before today because we got them from the Parliamentary Budget Office. For those of you who are good, uh, you used to work as a bookies runner, that's 1.2%. 9 billion, is, uh, 9 billion is a percentage of 735. So this year, even though they said they've got the message on Medicare, it's 1.2%. And they're locking in $3.2 billion of cuts which patients are going to have to principally find or your practices will have to find. So if you look at then what they've done over the next uh, three years of the forward estimates on top of this year, they eventually find another billion which is good, but of course it comes later in the process. So patients, when you net out what the government says they're doing, 2.2 billion, you know your patients. I don't know every one of your individual patients, but I do know a lot of people who go and see the doctor who don't earn a lot of money. You can't defer being sick if you don't have money, can you? You can't defer treatment. So when the government says to you that they've heard the message, you have to ask yourself, how can you hear a message when you're happy to find money for corporate tax cuts, when you're happy to find money for other propositions, but you can't find the money for patient rebates? It's all a question of priorities. So my analysis of the government is this. They figure that healthcare in this country will be happy with $9 million this year extra into the Medicare system. They are probably hoping and counting on the fact that $9 million will be enough to make people happy. If you like, it's the minimum they can get away with paying to keep people silent. $9 million is their attempt to keep the system silent. I wonder sometimes if they're more focused on the critics than the patients. I think for a long time there's been a mistake in politics to look at this as an argument between the medical profession and the government. It's not. The whole debate about the Medicare freeze was about what patients receive and who bears the cost in the system. And I certainly believe that the government wants to do the least possible they think they can get away with in order to acquire the silence of the system. It's like cash for no comment. But I actually think the debate about healthcare in this country is much better than that. I'm happy to have a debate with the government about the future health care in this country. We're happy to have a debate about how we should fund uh, health care homes policy. But by the way, in the budget, the fact is they're delaying the rollout of health care homes. So in fact, it's been a cut of 24.6 million over the next two years. And let's be clear about health care homes. I think they're a good way to go. I think they are worthy of investment. But you can't do it on the cheap. You can't ask a practice whose business model relies on volume of patients, and with the best will in the world they have to, if you're asking practices to change towards management of people, uh, you've got to have some extra money to help the practice adjust. You can't do change on the cheap. And again, I believe the government's got a calculus here, which is what is the minimum they can pay to make healthcare issues go away as an election point? Whereas I think the question to ask is what is it that we need to have a healthy generation in the future? And all those other issues I initially raised. I mean, if you look at, for instance, uh, the healthcare home funding, it's a real cut of 24.6 million. I think it harms the prospects of those one in five Australians living with multiple chronic diseases. But what's interesting is in the final year for the budget papers, the funding formula for hospitals reverts to the former Prime Minister Abbott's formula of CPI and population growth. I do not believe there are hospital administrators who think that the cost of hospitals can be simply measured by the CPI and population growth alone. Now, I think that uh, the majority of states and territories are still struggling with some of their targets 
And we can have a debate about the accuracy or the efficiency of targets, but they are struggling. I don't believe that cutting money from hospitals is going to improve the system. Now, I know that what I'm saying perhaps is not totally comfortable for some. You know, really, shouldn't we just be happy? Uh, do we really want to have health care as a political issue? You know, I understand that. But what I also say is that the AMA is a special organisation. You have a position which Australians take very seriously. Your very presence here shows you how importantly you take that obligation. I've spent my entire life representing people. That is not easy. It's one thing to help cure a person, but it's another thing when you talk to a group of doctors, or in my case it was a group of shearers or oil rig workers, you might think you've done the best thing in the world, but you come to the next meeting and there's a new issue, which you think you never raised that before. When did this issue come from? I understand it's not easy. I really do. But what I also know is that even though there's always an alternative view and that there's always pressure, and there's plenty of free advice from people with a large supply of hindsight and a, uh, not a lot of responsibility, your role in this national debate about healthcare is important. And what I believe is that we should have the best healthcare system in the world. And in many cases, I think we do have a healthcare system and parts of it which can legitimately call best in the world. But for the contribution the parliament can make, I think that we need to have much more certainty of funding. It's not the job of the AMA to worry about the budget of the nation. Of course, you've got to pay attention to it. But I believe that the parliament of this nation is sufficiently clever to more adequately and properly fund our Medicare and our healthcare system without offering up what we've seen in this last budget. Perhaps it would have been nicer if I could just come here and say to everyone, it's all good. We're swinging hands in government and the opposition. It's all a happy ending. The problem is when I've examined what the government's actually said, I would be dishonest to my own values if I said that's fine, because I don't think it's right. For me, what matters is the patience. We shouldn't accept political fixes and compromises when in fact we can do better. If we take the path as a nation, leave aside even the healthcare debate, if we take the path as a nation the path of least resistance. If we accept the tyranny of low expectations, then we are guaranteed to fall off the pace. For me, when I stand here in this remarkable gathering of leaders of healthcare, I know that the patients, the people with the chronic diseases, the kids who are not getting enough exercise, the ones who are eating the wrong food, the families now currently making that 17th interview to find an adequate aged care facility, the people dealing with the trauma of an unexpected heart attack, people injured at work, people seeking rehabilitation, all of the young doctors studying now, the nurses, the healthcare, the allied health professionals. We need to have a long-term vision for healthcare in this country, and we need to not only have the fine words, we need to have the resources behind it. I promise you that at the next election, we will demonstrate not only our words, we will properly fund health care because we don't think we should settle for anything less for our patients. You don't settle for anything less than the best for your patients. Why and I as opposition leader should settle for anything less than the best for your patients too? Good morning and thank you for listening to me. Uh, thank you, Bill, for the challenge. Um, uh, the opposition leader was happy to take questions, but uh, he's already uh, taken uh, 10 minutes off. He's very uh, uh, capable uh, health spokesperson. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Catherine King. Uh, Catherine's become a familiar face at AMA National Conference. I'm told that this might be conference number four for her. Uh, she's been here more often than many of our delegates. Catherine was uh, first elected the member for Ballarat in 2001. She was appointed parliamentary secretary in the portfolios of health and ageing and infrastructure and transport in the Gillard government in 2010. She had responsibility for the TGA, food standards and the Organ and Tissue Authority and even then became known to the AMA. 
In March 2013, Catherine was elevated to the roles of Minister for Regional Services, Local Communities and Territories, and Minister for Road Safety. In, 20, in July 2013, she was promoted to Cabinet. And then in October 2013, she became Shadow Minister for Health in Bill Shorten's Shadow Cabinet. A keen, lifelong learner, Catherine has a degree in social work and a Master's in Public Policy from ANU. And in her spare time, she's currently completing a law degree from Deakin University. Uh, Catherine King works closely with the AMA, and it's my pleasure to again welcome her to our national conference. Thanks very much for that introduction, Michael, and good morning. It's uh, terrific to be here today. First, let me to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather, and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Can I also acknowledge and commend the AMA's continued work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities? As leaders in our health care system, you are playing your part in closing the gap in Indigenous life expectancy and health outcomes, which should be our highest national priority. Like Bill, I also want to welcome your recent statement on same-sex marriage. I hope that your voice will help us achieve marriage equality. Looking at the program for the conference, it's clear that there is no shortage of political interest in health. In fact, it was a bit like being in Parliament with so many politicians around. Of course, budget analysis is much of the focus at this time of the year. But with the dust starting to settle, we now get to look beyond the prepackaged media announcements to actually examine what the budget means for health and critically, where do we go from here? Bill has outlined the many challenges of our health, our health system faces, including in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. So I'll keep my comments brief and I am very, very happy to take questions afterwards if there's time. I've been here many times before and while I've seen some movement around the politics of health, there are some things that have not changed. I've spoken before about the need to put prevention at the heart of our healthcare system that has not changed. I've spoken about the urgency of primary care reform. That has not changed. And I've spoken before about the critical need to properly invest in our hospitals. That has not changed. Two years ago, I flagged Labor's focus on prevention, primary care and hospitals. I still think that these are at the core of our future health roadmap and I'd like to touch on some of our current thinking on each of these. But I do first want to touch briefly on the budget because this is important to understand where we're at. We don't accept that the budget has reversed the damage done by the 2016, 2015 and 2014 budgets. As Bill has flagged, we will continue to take the fight to the government on their cuts, including the fact that it's $3.2 billion that the Liberals are continuing to take out of Medicare patient rebates. We are particularly disappointed that they didn't drop their cuts altogether. The budget was a clear opportunity to drop the freeze from July 1, but again, they've kicked it down the road. And what they haven't been honest enough to explain, but which we know, is that it won't unfreeze all GP items until 2020. Approximately 113 GP items and allied health items remain frozen until then including items for mental health plans and health assessments. The damage the government's long-term freeze has done is not just to the relationship between healthcare professionals and the government, it is the damage to our healthcare system and its patients. And a compact, an agreement, a deal does not fix that. The last three years have unmistakably been a missed opportunity in healthcare reform. It is now more important than ever to focus on the health system that Australia will need in the next 10, the next 20 years, and the steps that we actually have to take together to get there. One of the greatest missed opportunities of the last three years is in prevention, in keeping Australians healthy and in preventing chronic disease. I think we all agree that turning the tide in chronic disease crisis will take years, maybe decades. So it's particularly galling that we've wasted three years in this space. In government and in the $300 million commitment we took to the last election, 
Labor focused on the modifiable risk factors that drive chronic disease, physical inactivity, poor nutrition, tobacco and alcohol use. While I'm not announcing our policies for the next election today, I do remain firmly of the view that we need a national physical activity strategy modelled on Scotland and other world leaders to get all Australians moving more in all settings, not just through organised sport. A national nutrition framework to help improve the food that Australians can access, particularly children. A focus on groups that continue to smoke at alarming rates, including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and Australians with mental illness, as well as population-wide measures and a renewed national effort on harmful use of alcohol and other drugs. The urgency of reform is also obvious in primary care. I do acknowledge the Medicare benefit schedule review and healthcare homes and the good work that many in this room have done. But so far, these have been marked by activity, not delivery. And there are signs they are doomed to fail. Clinical-led, clinician-led, evidence-based reforms to the MBS are only useful if ministers have the courage to implement them. Models of integrated primary care can only be rolled out with investment from governments and buy-in from the profession. Labor's vision in primary care is led by GPs, but much more integrated with other specialists, allied health and other health providers. We also want much better coordination between primary care and our hospitals. But we're not so arrogant as to impose a one-size-fits-all model. At the last election, we committed 100 million, 100 million in new money to develop and roll out new models of primary care. This work would have been undertaken by a Centre for Medicare and Health System Innovation as part of a new permanent health reform commission, and of course in close consultation with the profession. Importantly, we committed that every dollar that is saved from the MBS review would be reinvested in innovations in Medicare. That was not only to allay fears that the MBS review or similar processes in the future was about cost cutting, but to give models, give new models, a way of scaling up nationally. How many times have we tried new innovative models in the healthcare system only to have them not be rolled out because there's no money? In government, Labor committed to fund 50% of the efficient growth in hospital costs. Our agreement gave hospitals long-term funding certainty and had started to see the end of the blame game between the Commonwealth and the states. At the election, Labor reiterated the commitment over the budget forward estimates. We also committed additional funding to reduce emergency department, department and elective surgery waiting times, and your own public hospital report card shows how desperately needed that investment is. Just as importantly, Labor committed to begin a national conversation on public hospitals led by the Healthcare Reform Commission. Big questions are at stake. Like what will our public hospitals look like in five and ten years? And how do we fund system innovations such as work on preventable readmissions, improvements in patient safety and translation of research? These go beyond any one depart government department or jurisdiction. But while the government says it will strike a new agreement with the states in 2018, I see absolutely no evidence of a public process towards this, no opportunity for crucial stakeholders like the AMA to have their say. Today I want to set out three principles for a post-2020 hospitals funding agreement. First, the Commonwealth needs to invest more in public hospitals and over a longer horizon. Anyone who thinks that it is sufficient to fund just 45% of efficient growth for just three years, with increases capped at just 6.5%, has not been to a public hospital recently. And as Bill quite rightly points out, the budget actually reverts the Commonwealth's contribution to Tony Abbott's 2014 formula of CPI and population growth beyond that, which is a significant cut to the Commonwealth's contribution. Second, in consulting with states and other stakeholders, the Commonwealth should consider new ways of investing in public hospitals and reducing pressure on acute beds. I refer particularly to the Commonwealth's role in subacute care, those psychogeriatric beds, the GEM beds, our mental health and our rehabilitation beds, and in outpatients. And third, activity-based funding was necessary and important, but it of course was not the end game. The next hospital funding agreement needs to drive further reforms, for example, to ensure quality and safety and embed electronic medical records and link them with primary care. 
Of course, Labor cannot negotiate the post-2020 hospital agreements from opposition, but we are actively refining our hospital's policy so that the parameters for that agreement are clear by the time we take office. I invite those of you with a particular interest in the future of our public hospitals to join us. It's time, of course, to renew our national discussion on health and health care. While we are in opposition, we will work with the government where we can, and we will fight them where we must. But the last three years have made clear that it takes a Labor government to drive significant health reforms that benefit all Australians. I look forward to working with you over the rest of this parliament and beyond. Thank you for having me this morning. So Michael has said I'm OK to take questions, so I'm really happy to do that. I'm sorry that you haven't had the opportunity to do that beforehand. And I can't quite see either, so you'll have to jump up if you do. Yep. If you let me know where you're from too, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Hi, Alison Sorensen. I'm the WA Delegate and GP Registrar. Um, Bill Shorten stated that what defines leadership is when you do the thing that no one else can or will do. Um, so will Labor stand up and stop the rort that has become the after hours Medicare um, use of the overuse of Medicare item numbers for urgent after hours care, knowing that it will be a very unpopular move with the corporates that have sure. used it as an opportunity to make money, and for patients that don't understand that it's actually costing them yep. significantly with regards to their long-term health. Yeah, thanks very much for that. Now, we were pretty critical, frankly, and I know it wasn't something that was supported here in this room, but you know, the reason we took the after-hours money and put it with Medicare locals was actually to try and drive better provision of after-hours care across geographic areas. And it had started to work. It wasn't perfect. I'm not going to say that it was. The government took the decision to take that money, to put that money back, back directly into practices, keep some of it with the primary health networks. But now what you've seen is obviously with the deputising services, a, you know, a, a quite a disruptive um, element that's actually headed into the, the after hours care provision. I think on the one hand, we've got patients who are desperately wanting to access after hours care. And we've got to deal with that. We absolutely have to deal with that. And then you've got a service that is costing now, I think it's around $250 million per year and it's been growing. I understand the MBS review has provided some recommendations to the government. I am worried that they are not going to see the light of day. There's some pretty, I think this is really, and Steve will probably nod at me briefly, that this is where the rubber really hits the road in this latest set of recommendations. I think you've got recommendations around IVF, you've got recommendations around um, uh, uh, home doctor services as well. We've been asked by the deputising service, they've been emailing our members uh, very heavily to come and campaign with them to save um, the home doctor service. We have not done that. And the reason we've not done that is because we actually think there is need for reform in this area. We want to see what the government's proposing so we don't know we haven't got oversight of the MBS review and we will scrutinise that. But the principle I want to take to it is that if you've got $250 million currently being spent on after hours care, then that money should continue to be spent on after-hours care. And that that money should, in fact, actually be spent on after-hours care by GP practices. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Sorry. Hi. I'm Pe squinting at you all. Oh, Sorry. Gino Pecoraro. I'm an obstetrician gynaecologist from Brisbane in Queensland. We've heard from both sides that they are committed to supporting private hospital treatment and the private sector because it takes pressure off the public sector and the system works best when both parts work together. We've got a major problem with the insurance policies that are currently available and sold to patients where they're covering very, very little. They don't cover the full cost of services. They're really only hospital bed insurance. Where does your party stand on making sure that important, vital, normal parts of life, like getting pregnant, for example, will be covered by all policies that are able to be sold, and that if you're not going to include things like pregnancy in a basic entry-level policy, you shouldn't be able to sell the policy because it's useless? So the first thing we said in the election campaign is then we had a policy to basically remove the private health insurance rebate from junk policies. We shouldn't, the, the Commonwealth shouldn't be paying for that if it's a, a policy that's literally, um, you know, meaningless. It's a 
public hospital only policy, for example, or it has significant exclusions, then the rebate shouldn't be there. So we, we were partly using that to actually try and drive reform. The government has obviously um, made the announcement around this sort of, I'm a bit critical of the categories around bronze, what is it, bronze, silver and gold that they're going to have. And part of what they're trying to do through that is actually drive some changes to that. I understand that process has got pretty bogged down with the private health insurers as there's a debate about what's going to go into that bronze category. Um, well, right, there needs to be much more transparency and we shouldn't be supporting policies or, or products that actually deliver no benefit to patients. And there's several levers the government's got to do that. One of them obviously is around transparency, but the other obviously is around the rebate, and that's what we had planned to do. So would your side promote having those important things included in the entry level policies? We'd certainly want to make sure that people were getting, uh, understood the products that they were getting, and there was absolute transparency. So if people need obstetric care, and that's clear that they need obstetric care, that that is the policies that they're getting, and that certainly the policies that are promoted to them. So thank the you. question was, would you, if you were in government, would you make sure that those important things were in the entry level policy? I understand transparency. Sure. Yeah, well, as, a, as I said, I think that the issue really very much at the moment is whether that is in fact actually going to drive that change. So I think the principle is that you want to make sure that the policies have value for people and that through transparency you drive that. So thank you. Who's next? Hello, one, two. Yep, thank you. Uh, uh, Paul Neeskin's GP, Harvey Bay, which is just to the west of Fraser Island, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm, I've been watching the uh, the... the policy for many years all the way back to the Health Reform Commission which was a wonderful process of consultation and putting things together and one of the important things that came out of that was the National Preventative Health Task Force and the agency and you've mentioned the importance of prevention Minister Hunt mentioned the importance of prevention and I think we do need to be sure we have effective evidence-based prevention it's not just a label now we my question is that uh, will the if, if we had a Labor government, would you be reinstituting the National Preventative Health Agency and the wonderful document that they produced the, towards 2020, The Healthiest Australia, which I recall was a very balanced and appropriate way of targeting obesity, alcohol and tobacco. That was scuttled in 14, as you're aware. So what would your government, if you were in government's position, be to reinstituting um, a, a, what I thought was a very valuable organisation and um, the Preventative Health Authority. Thanks very much for that. In fact, we actually used the um, Preventative Health Task Force strategy as the basis for our prevention policy. So it is still, if anyone hasn't read it, it is still an entirely relevant document today uh, and one in which prevention strategies should be based. We had this bizarre circumstance where um, I tried to save two really, well, several, but two really important organisations, both um, National Health Workforce Australia and the National Preventative Health Agency in the Senate. Uh, we were able to save the legislation for the National Preventative, Preventative Health Agency has never, didn't pass the Senate, so it got blocked in the Senate. So it exists as an entity and a name, but of course then what the government did was took all its money. So uh, it um, sits there, there is a piece of legislation, so it is still established. Uh, and unfortunately, we're unable to save the National Health Workforce Agency, despite um, our, our good friends at times, the Greens, uh, helping us try and do that as well. But um, what I was, I've been through a few iterations. So I've been through, um, I probably predate that. I was um, involved in the National Public Health Partnership, which is a partnership between uh, the Commonwealth and the states where we, uh, basically I was a Commonwealth officer located in the Victorian, in the National Public Health Partnership office. And we tried to look at how you um, develop better preventative health strategies, put money into pooled, um, uh, 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 interventions in prevention. I think there's been lots of iterations. I'm not convinced that the National Preventative Health Agency in and of itself will be the answer. I think what it actually does require is national leadership in partnership with the states to invest in prevention uh, and invest in evidence-based prevention. And I think that's been sadly lacking. 
We did take that $300 million package, which included a range of, um, a range of preventative health measures to the last election. But one of those that I also wanted to do, which we're still having a bit of a look at, was looking at a broader information platform for people in prevention. Um, I quite like the Victorian government's Better Health Channel. Uh, I like the work that Live Light has done out of Western Australia. So we're still having a look at ideas around that. If you've got a very firm view around the National Preventative Health Agency, I'm very happy for you to put that case to me. But thank you. Do you want me to, you, you want me to finish up? Hang on. I'll take, how about I take one more? I think I can see. Is that Lorraine? I can yeah. see. It is. Hello. Hi, Lorraine. Hello. Is this on? Yeah. Um, Dr Lorraine Baker, President of AMA Victoria and a practising GP in urban Melbourne. However, I've been on the road in rural and regional Victoria in the last two weeks, uh, both in the Mallee and in Gippsland. And what I'm aware of at our regional hospitals is that the cost pressures on management and boards there are driving a de-skilling of the workforce and an exploitation of the workforce in those hospitals, including the GP workforce from the communities. The complexities are enormous around retaining doctors in rural areas, and by that I mean retaining quality, experienced workforce in those areas. I can't see a single solution that is federally or state driven and I do hope that you will be supporting a very considered approach across Australia to the challenges both in training the workforce, securing the workforce, protecting the workforce and contributing to the, the richness of those communities and the care in those areas. Uh, thanks very much for that, Lorraine, and thanks for your continued ab advocacy, particularly in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health. Look, and the Rural Doctors Association obviously has um, worked with the government on the Rural Health Commissioner, and we've uh, look, we've supported it. We've been critical that you know, look, it was a, it felt like a bit of window dressing to start with. It actually had to be something meaningful, and obviously they've managed to extract. Uh, a commitment to a rural generalist pathway, and I'd be very um, keen to hear uh, the AMA's uh, views on on that and what that would what that would look like, because I think the Queensland model is not going to be quite right in every other state and territory uh, as well. I think it's got some real potential. Um, in, in rural areas, but it, you know it's going to take a long time to actually work work that up and see see how that's going to assist uh, in the health workforce more generally. Um, we also think the rural health commissioner has to do much more than that, and it's much more broadly about not just the GP workforce. It's also about how do you get specialists, how do you get allied health professionals. And again, that's sort of one of the damning indictments of losing Health Workforce Australia is that we had an independent statutory body who was charged with doing this work, uh, charged with reporting to, um, to health ministers and actually trying to get that engagement with states and territories. We've lost, lost, we've lost a lot of oversight about some of the workforce stuff that's happening within the department. Um, obviously, there's a lot of money and we're coming to the tail end of all of the work that we started under Health Workforce Australia. Um, so if you've got good ideas, we're very interested to hear them. So thank you. Thanks for having me today too. I've noticed my lovely husband bought me a Fitbit for Mother's Day, but I don't know if anyone's seen the new one. It buzzes constantly to tell you that you have to move, and mine has literally told me I'm supposed to go and do 200 steps. So I will finish on that note. Thank you for having me. Thank you again, Catherine. Uh, it's now my pleasure to welcome the leader of the Australian Greens, Senator Richard Di Natale, also known as Dr Di Natale, also an AMA member along the way. Dr Richard Di Natale is leader of the Australian Greens, Senator for Victoria, and the Greens spokesperson on health, sport and multiculturalism. The son of Italian migrants, Richard grew up in Melbourne and now lives on an off-grid working farm in the foothills of Victoria's Otway Ranges with his wife Lucy and their two young sons. Prior to entering Parliament, Richard was a VFA footballer, a general practitioner and a public health specialist. He worked in Aboriginal health in the Northern Territory, on HIV prevention in India and as a drug and alcohol clinician in regional Victoria. Richard was elected as the Greens' first ever Senator for Victoria in 2010 and became the party's third leader when Christine Milne stepped down in May 2015. He is the co-convener of the Parliamentary Group for Drug Policy and Law Reform, 
the Parliamentary Friends of West Papua, and the Parliamentary Friends of Medicine. The AMA has a positive working relationship with Senator Di Natale on a range of issues. I'm told Richard makes a mean pizza, I'm told he grows and bottles his own wine, and I know he's a long-suffering Richmond fan. Please welcome Senator Dr Richard Di Natale. Um, thank you so much. Let me begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and uh, pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. Acknowledge that this land was never ceded and that we have uh, huge strides to make in closing the gap. Um, let me also acknowledge uh, Michael, uh, Vice, uh, President of the AMA and Vice President Tony Bartone as well. Um, I'm not sure if we've got any of our other parliamentarians in the audience, but I understand you had uh, an address from Greg Hunt and Bill Shorten, and of course, uh, just recently from Catherine King. Um, let me also acknowledge um, the Chair of the um, AMA Council, uh, uh, Bev uh, Robotham as well. And of course, all of you, uh, conference delegates, it's a great pleasure to be here again. Um, I think I was here a year ago, and uh, we we're in the midst of an election campaign, and it was the sort of election campaign that uh, went on and on and on, and um, we're all glad it's over. But um, one of the things during that election campaign that became very, very clear was that health was a very key battleground, um, and it's become one of the defining issues of this parliamentary term. If, if we learn anything from that election campaign, it's that Australians value and identify with um, having a world-class universal healthcare system. It was a reaffirmation of the things that uh, most Australians believe in. And um, anyone who wants to make cuts uh, in health does that at their peril. Um, the role, of course, of the AMA in helping to shape the health deba debate has been very significant. Um, you played a very key role in putting an end to the freeze on um, MBS item numbers. It was basically, look, the MBS freeze was a way of bringing in co-payments through the back door. They were unsuccessful in 2014, and uh, it was an attempt to drive GPs to introduce co-payments as a result of um, a cut in uh, real terms when it comes to the Medicare rebate. Um, it's worth noting that the freeze was introduced by the Labor Party. We're pleased to see the back of it. Um, but we are disappointed at the very slow pace of restoring that indexation. So we're still waiting, uh, we'll be waiting for at least a year before we start to see many of those changes flow through. The reason, you know, we believe the Medicare indexation freeze was so damaging is because it really challenges the idea of what universal health care is about. Price should never be a barrier for people to access health care. And it was so important that the profession played a very important role in drawing to people's attention the impact of the cut for average, average Australians, particularly if you're living in uh, regional communities um, or other areas of need, um, the, the impact of rising prices. And it was very important. I think the AMA played a, a very important role uh, in that debate. But I'd also say the AMA is much stronger when it is not just arguing for what's in its own interests and the profession's interests, and, and usually, hopefully, the interests of the profession and the community um, overlap. But the AMA is much more powerful when it's um, not just a union, but it's taking a lead role in public health debates. And the work of the AMA in so many areas, like the harms associated with alcohol, plain packaging laws around tobacco, have played a key role in uh, providing political leadership. And I, I get a sense of pride when I hear my former professions speak out uh, in support of these important measures. I, I, I was really pleased, let me tell you, when the AMA released its position paper in support of marriage equality. Might, so among some members, that might still be seen as controversial, but it is within the best traditions of the AMA's public health advocacy. Um, it's undeniable that having discrimination entrenched in law does damage the health of Australians. If you're a LGBTIQ Australian, um, having entrenched discrimination has an impact on people's health and wellbeing. We know there are higher rates of 
self-harm, depression, anxiety and so on amongst young kids who are struggling with sexuality and gender. Um, and it is important that we um, take that issue on as health professionals. And of course, there are thousands of gay and lesbian doctors, medical students, who will appreciate their representative body taking a strong stand on what should be regarded as a health issue, but also a human rights issue. So let me applaud you for ensuring equality under the law. Um, the AMA's played a very important role in the discussion around obesity at the moment, and the um, call for the coalition government to convene an obesity crisis, I think that's important. Um, you all know that Australia's obesity rates are significant. We look at the AIHW who reported last year that 11 million people over 18 years of age um, are overweight or obese. And two thirds of those uh, are adults. Um, only one third in the healthy weight range. In 2014, one in four kids between five and 14 overweight or obese. Um, we know that it is a significant issue. Australia is one of the, in terms of um, overall figures, fifth most obese country in the OECD. Now, it's careful we don't stigmatise people or marginalise them in this debate. It's easy to blame individuals, but we have to accept there are huge problems coming down the line for those people, and of course a tidal wave of costs to the health budget in the years to come. I think the Grattan Institute have um, estimated that the cost of obesity the, on the budget is about $5 billion each year. But look, much more significant uh, than that is the impact on people's lives. Uh, I'm hearing stories now from medical practitioners who are seeing people come in with adult onset diabetes presenting at a much younger age. Most of us in our practice have seen people who have struggled with weight and, and many of the conditions that flow from that, diabetes, heart disease, peripheral vascular disease, joint conditions and so on. And, and we all do our best and play a very important role in helping to manage that chronic disease, underlie some of those um, contributing factors, helping people change their diet, become more physically active, sometimes referring people to surgery. Um, it, you know, the, the health profession plays a very, very critical role in that. But it is also important to remember that this is an issue that has to be addressed at, at a systemic policy level. And uh, hard as we might try as clinicians, we have to address this right across the spectrum from what we can do within our clinical environments to that uh, policy uh, public health level. And part of that is taking on the power of the food industry. We have to accept that that is one of the battles that we face right now. So what do we need to do? Well, our own experiences, but also the evidence tells us what works. Firstly, we know this much like any other public health issue, there has to be a broad response, a holistic whole of government response. And that starts with how we plan our cities, the environments that people uh, work and live in having public open space, having opportunities for people to walk to catch their, um, the most appropriate form of public transport, um, ensuring that we educate kids in schools about uh, healthy eating, having environments at work that promote physical activity. All of those things are critical. But let's also remember that we have to take on those vested interests. Mandatory food labelling, we support the AMA's call um, for mandatory food labelling, not a voluntary opaque scheme. We want clear restrictions on junk food advertising um, to protect kids and parents. At the moment, young kids are bombarded with ads uh, to consume junk food. And uh, there are some measures like price that we know can be effective, which is why we have uh, called for an excise on sugar sweetened beverages. We know that the evidence around the world is that can be effective. Uh, we've seen examples in many other jurisdictions. So an excise, the equivalent of 20% of the retail price of uh, water-based sugar-sweetened beverages paid by the producer uh, would help to drive down the rates of obesity. We know that. We've done some modelling uh, to demonstrate. While it's not a silver bullet, the Parliamentary Budget Office projected it would raise something like $500 million a year, $2 billion over the forward estimates, to be spent back in health, oral health, 
obesity prevention measures. And we know that that a price signal would lead to a drop of about 12% in the consumption of these sugary sweetened drinks. We have to do more. So the AMA's intervention on this has been important. Um, this nonsense of, well, well, as Barnaby Joyce says, just eat less. I mean, if we said that sort of stuff to patients as part of our obesity prevention strategies, it's a good chance we'd be reported. Um, so we are looking at this year um, having a Senate a committee look at this issue in greater detail, and we look forward to working with the AMA on that. Look forward to your recommendations for that inquiry. So many areas that the AMA um, has to be proud of. Also, I think the uh, role that the AMA has paid um, in addressing the health impacts of the government's, what I would call inhumane treatment of innocent people, pe innocent people seeking asylum in this country. And, um, the AMA has, uh, in recent years, been very strong in their advocacy, and I do hope that that will continue uh, well into the future. We have, at the moment, um, uh, the uh, prospect of the Manus Island Detention Centre closing. We've got genuine refugees who've been, uh, who have uh, uh, been assessed as requiring protection, um, and yet, um, at this stage, we have a government that says that they will not settle those refugees here in Australia. Um, the impact on those innocent people uh, is horrific. Uh, the mental health, the physical health impacts are horrific, and the AMA, I hope, will continue playing a strong role in their advocacy. Um, we know that the impact of climate change on health is another key area where the AMA has an important role in driving policies forward. I think The Lancet famously uh, called uh, climate change the greatest global health uh, opportunity of the 21st century. And it notes that moving towards cleaner energy production, cleaner transport, having a new economy would not just be good for the economy, but would dramatically ensure a range of positive health co-benefits. So I do hope uh, that um, the recent comments that the closure of coal-fired power stations may have more uh, positive than negative impacts were in fact a, an error of judgment and they don't signal a change in direction for the organisation. Uh, let me urge you to support the work of the Climate and Health Alliance, which has brought together stakeholders from across the health sector to push for meaningful action on the health impacts of climate change. A and I look forward to working uh, with uh, some of your members to launch the strategy alongside Minister White and uh, um, Catherine King in Parliament next month, and I hope the AMA will join us for that. Uh, closer to home, the AMA's core business working for an improvement to our health system is so critical. Um, we had this sort of campaign which was all about privatising Medicare. Now, if ever you wanted to see um, a campaign about issues in health that have nothing to do with improving the health system. That was it. That was a triumph of politics over health policy. And we had this faux debate about whether the government was going to privatise um, the health system when, in fact, there were so many other more pressing uh, challenges uh, to confront. Now, the good news is that it seems there has been a reluctant acceptance from the government that um, we can't continue to cut health and, indeed, um, there may be some signs that they are prepared to look at new areas, and I'll come to some of those in a moment. Let me start with, firstly, the budget. We had the Medicare Guarantee Fund. Well, again, another triumph of politics over policy. It's a glorified bank account. I don't think it protects health one bit. If governments want to raid um, the health dollar, they will do it, regardless or not of whether there is a Medicare Guarantee Fund. But at least, if there's anything um, um, positive that can be said about it is that, is that it is a recognition that the government understands how much Australians value their health. Um, last, uh, last year, I think the Prime Minister was up here talking about revolution in primary health care and um, the health care homes trial was one that engaged most of the sector. Um, conceptually, we support it. So conceptually, the idea that we have a more integrated model uh, that ensures that we're managing chronic disease in a way that doesn't just reward throughput but re uh, rewards 
Outcomes, I think, is at least conceptually a very important step to have better integration with general practitioners, with allied health, indeed, with um, uh, physicians who are involved in coordinating the care of, um, of people with chronic illnesses. So that uh, at least signalled the start of a debate. Unfortunately, what we don't want is uh, exercise in rationing the healthcare dollar, um, a, a proposal with insufficient detail, insufficient resources, and something that has the capacity to set the cause of health reform back. Um, and unfortunately, the budget really put the healthcare homes in the too hard basket. I was pleased to see that there was actually a commitment um, from uh, the government to work with the AMA in their compact uh, on improvements in um, uh, more integrated care. Uh, but the concern we have is that the government's put this reform in the too hard basket. Now, while that might seem a victory for some people, um, healthcare reform, particularly reform in primary health, is absolutely critical. And unless the, the um, medical community engages in that debate, we're going to see more uh, policies like the freeze on indexation, which was, let's remember, bipartisan in an attempt to rein in um, the healthcare dollar. And, uh, and it's my view that what we need to do is see greater investment, but also ensure that that investment in healthcare um, allows us to manage the growing burden of chronic disease on our community in a way uh, that ensures that we have uh, different models for um, looking after people who are visiting their GP. Now, in the budget, there's clearly no other plan for tackling health care. But we heard, I heard some questions about prevention. Well, uh, there is absolutely no uh, plan from this government when it comes to um, investing in the prevention of our health care system. And I, that always baffles me because we know and this is a government that prides itself on um, being fiscally responsible. We know what the um, best investment in health care is, and that is in prevention, of course, one of the problems in that is that it requires long-term thinking and we have governments who are focused just on the short term. Uh, and of course, we know that one of the other issues with prevention is the people whose lives are improved as a result of a greater investment in prevention often don't know that. They're not a powerful political voice. Much, more easy, much easier to respond to somebody who's spent uh, a few hours in an emergency department than the many hundreds or indeed thousands of people who have had uh, uh, a heart attack averted or whose um, diabetic control is improved. Uh, so that's one of the challenges, but we do know that um, investing in prevention is so important, which is why we do support the um, Preventative Health Agency being re-established. We thought that was a very positive reform uh, from uh, the previous Labor government. Uh, and we'd like to see a lot of the funds that were cut from prevention, particularly through the flexible funds, um, to be restored because they were finally doing some good work around uh, obesity uh, management, um, smoking prevention and so on. We also say a few words about private health. Uh, understand that issue um, is of great concern to many uh, AMA members. Um, we have huge private health funds who continue to list exemptions the transparency for um, people uh, who hold those funds is lacking. Um, it's only until people need to use their fund that they realise that they might not be covered for a particular procedure. Um, we need uh, a radical overhaul of the private health insurance system. Uh, we've got a sector that gets over $6 billion every year in public subsidies, over $6 billion and yet um, they are able to continue to increase premiums, to withdraw the level of products that are offered to people, um, and the government continues to provide that, that guarantee through the private health insurance rebate. Our view is that the private health insurance rebate would be much better directed into other parts of the health system. But at the very least, if you're going to provide that level of subsidy to an industry, um, you should be ensuring that the level of coverage that people get is coverage that ensures that uh, they don't get a shock when they're unwell and go to use their uh, policy. 
Let me um, finish with one of the more unsavoury um, aspects of the budget, the focus on drug testing for people who are receiving income support. Anybody who's worked in this field, and indeed I suspect anybody who's simply worked in general practice, would understand that uh, drug dependence is a very difficult uh, condition to manage. It's defined as a chronic relapsing condition. Uh, if you are substance dependent, there is a good chance that you'll go through a cycle where uh, you are in treatment, uh, you go back to using again, come back into treatment, and hopefully um, at the end of that process, you will um, uh, have a life, uh, a healthy life where you're no longer using illicit drugs or at least on a, um, on a substitution treatment program like methadone. Unfortunately, um, saying to an individual that should they use drugs at any time through their course of treatment, that they'll lose their income support is effectively pushing those people further into the abyss. They are people who will simply return to using and often, as we know, people who use uh, engage in criminal activities, sometimes dealing uh, drugs, sometimes worse. And if the government is looking to make a bad problem worse, then it's found the right solution to do that. So our view would be to ensure that the AMA are actively advocating against a policy that has no evidence base. In fact, where it's been tried overseas, it's failed spectacularly, um, and that we look at a much greater investment in the treatment of people who are substance dependent and uh, recognise that that's the pathway through which we're going to address the issue. Um, finally, uh, I want to finish with um, a topic that's of personal importance to me, but should also, I think, um, be uh, central to the work that we do as health professionals. Um, it's an issue uh, that is particularly poignant today. Today's Sorry Day. And today's a day we pay tribute to the stolen generations and commemorate the 20th anniversary of the Bringing Them Home report. Um, we know that right now there are um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community representatives meeting at Uluru to chart the course of their own futures through uh, a proposed referendum question. Now, some of you will know this, but I started off my career as a GP and worked a lot in Indigenous health. And um, it's one of the reasons I ended up being a politician. Uh, working in an environment, it's very, it's all good and well to, to learn about the social model of health, to learn about social determinants and all of those upstream factors. But working in an Aboriginal health setting for a few years and experiencing what that means for people um, is a very sobering experience. And uh, it's one of the reasons I became a politician because addressing health care is not enough. We need to address issues like education, housing, employment, all of those things that we know are the contributors uh, to good health. And yet, here in Australia, we have uh, basically a community of people, our first Australians, who are living in conditions um, that are, can, can be described as nothing but abject poverty and deprivation. Now, I, um, I was lucky enough to go back to the place that I worked, Tennant Creek, uh, last week. Uh, I worked there as, uh, at, the, at the Aboriginal Health Clinic and it was 17 years since I last worked there. And while I was, it's a real privilege to meet so many of the people doing incredible work, uh, many of them Indigenous, leaders of their community, um, battling against the odds to improve the health of their people. Uh, in the 17 years uh, since I've been back, I would say that things have got worse rather than better. Uh, when I was there, uh, women could deliver in Tennant Creek. They can't do that now. They're forced onto a bus and travel 500 kilometres to Alice. So you have to leave your family, your support, your country to go and have a baby. Um, when I was there, public housing was always difficult. There's now a 10-year waiting list for public housing, not a new house built for 30 years. So dozens of people living in a house. Any surprise that a young child uh, with chronic ear disease uh, ends up with hearing impairment, learning difficulties, and, be and begins their life uh, on a spiral downwards. Uh, rheumatic heart disease, a disease that doesn't exist almost anywhere else, or certainly not in Australia and in few other countries across the world. Ten-year-old kids having open-heart surgery to have their valves replaced. 
Renal disease, what's some of the highest rates of renal disease anywhere in the world? And so uh, it was with uh, a tinge of sadness that I left Tennant Creek knowing that in 17 years things have not improved despite the best efforts of so many people working hard to try and bridge the gap. We have effectively um, people living with diseases of poverty and sitting over the top of that are diseases, lifestyle diseases, sometimes called lifestyle or diseases of affluence, chronic um, diabetes uh, um, and, and a range of other related conditions. Um, we can and must do more. Uh, I just urge you, if you've got an opportunity, go and visit an Aboriginal community, spend some time. This isn't a political call, it's a call to you as health professionals and um, do something good educate yourselves, inform yourselves about what's going on, because I guarantee you, if you do that, uh, you'll come back and be advocates for what has to happen in Australia, and that is true justice with our First Peoples. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, Richard was happy to take questions, but we're running over time. Uh, but thank you again for your uh, uh, impassioned speech. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, and certainly, the AMA has been challenged by our political leaders today. We often challenge them. They've challenged us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the AMA National Conference would not be the AMA National Conference without awards. And it's now my great pleasure uh, to present a couple of awards. First, I have the pleasure of awarding the MJA, MDA National Prize for Excellence in Medical Research. This is an award, including a cash prize of $10,000 for the best research article published in the Medical Journal of Australia in the previous calendar year. The winner this year is a study implementing and examining the impact of a statewide program for the early recognition and treatment of sepsis in New South Wales hospital emergency departments. The winning article, Sepsis Kills, Early Intervention Saves Lives, was authored by Dr. Anthony Burrell from the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission, Professor Mary Louise McLaws from the School of Public Health and Community Medicine at the University of New South Wales, Ms. Mary Fullock, Sepsis Program Leader at the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission, Ms. Rosemary Sullivan from the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission, and Dr. Dung Kanwal Sindhu Sake, biostatistician at the New South Wales Clinical Excellence Commission. The study set up a quality improvement program called Sepsis Killed Kills across 97 emergency departments in New South Wales hospitals. The program promoted intervention within 60 minutes of recognition, including taking of blood cultures, measuring serum lactate levels, administration of intravenous antibiotics, and fluid resuscitation. The main outcome measure was the time to antibiotics and fluid resuscitation, mortality rates and length of stay. The Sepsis Kills program promotes early recognition and management of sepsis during the first few hours in New South Wales emergency departments. By focusing on the principle of recognise, resuscitate, refer, it is possible to reduce the time before antibiotics are administered and fluid resuscitation initiated. This program could be applied in other jurisdictions and its integration with antimicrobial stewardship requirements should be considered. MDA National has generously sponsored this prize and here on their behalf is Executive Manager of Insurance, Luke Thompson, along with Professor Jeff Thompson, Deputy Medical Ed Editor of the MJA. Uh, to accept the award on behalf of the research group, we welcome Mary Fullock and Professor Mary Louise McLaws. Will you please welcome them to the stage? Uh, Luke and Jeff will present the award and then I'd like to call on the recipients to Say a few words. Thanks, Michael. That's an excellent summary. You've said me a few words, which is lovely. I'd just like to very briefly also offer the MJA's contribution to Indigenous health um, by highlighting what we believe is an absolutely fantastic Indigenous health issue that's going to cover many of the things that need to be done in the um, near future. That's coming out in early July. 
The um, paper that Michael so well outlined has achieved already wide recognition. It's chosen through voting by the wider editorial committee of the um, Medical Journal of Australia, your journal. It's already been cited widely. The program, um, the most amazing statistic from which is the reduction in mortality from sepsis by about 25% has already been implemented in New South Wales and is spreading throughout the Australian continent as well as internationally. The paper's been cited widely also internationally and it's achieved a highly cited paper recognition from the um, international rating agency Thomson Reuters. So this paper reflects very much the impact clinically and internationally of the manuscripts that are being published in the journal under the leadership of Nick Talley. It also reflects um, the dual commitment of the journal to high profile, world leading, scholarly, translational research and the translation of that research into improved clinical outcomes. So I'd like to welcome on behalf of all the authors, Mary Louise McClaws and Mary Fullock and Luke Thompson from MDA National to join me in presenting these awards. Thanks, Luke. Well, thank you very much, Michael and Jeff. I'm delighted to be here today at the AMA National Conference to present on behalf of MDA National the MJA, MDA National Prize for Excellence in Medical Research for 2016. MDA National has been a sponsor of MGA and has been associated with the prize since 2011. We are proud to support this prize again this year and to acknowledge the outstanding work of dedicated clinicians and researchers. One of the founding principles of MDA National since 1925 was to support and protect members and to promote good medical practice. Support, protect and promote remain our reason for being to this day and this goes some way to explain why we are thrilled to support this award. MDA National is very much a part of the profession. To our members, we are part advisor, part confidant, part support network and part insurer. The relationship we have with our members is often deep and abiding. We are often among the first to know when something goes wrong and we play an important role in supporting and protecting our members through what is very often a difficult time. Frequently through these circumstances there are valuable lessons to be learned about practising in ways to optimise patient outcomes and we think this is an important contribution we make towards patient safety. Well, the 2016 prize of $10,000 goes towards the research outlined in the article. The winners of this prize uh, provided an outstanding article entitled, as you've heard, Sepsis Kills, Early Intervention Saves Lives. I'd like to welcome and thank Ms. Mary Fullock and Professor Mary Louise McClaws to accept on behalf of the team the 2016 MJA MDA National Prize for Excellence in Medical Research. Good afternoon. Thank you, Michael, Jeff and Luke. It's a great honour to be here today and to accept the award on behalf of our co-authors. It's a great outcome for the ongoing collaboration between the University of New South Wales and the Clinical Excellence Commission. 
First and foremost, I would like to thank the MGA judging panel for choosing Sepsis Kill's article from so many entries. Who would have thought? Having the paper pu published was a huge milestone for us and an enormous relief to get to that point. In particular, for Tony Burrell, our lead author, who couldn't be here today, it marked the end of his time working on the Sepsis Kills program and a long career in healthcare, and in particular in quality and safety. There's been huge widespread interest in the program, as you've heard, both nationally and internationally, and the publication has really helped us to spread the lessons learned. Thank you very much to MDA National for the very generous prize of $10,000. We intend to use that money to help support our clinicians further their work in the sepsis program, and hopefully they'll be able to do further evaluation and publication. As you've heard, the Sepsis Kills program is a quality improvement initiative, and our main aim was really to in engender a sense of urgency around the management of sepsis, so that it was treated as a, as a medical emergency, just like stroke, trauma, and acute coronary syndrome. We feel over the life of the program, which is now six years, that junior doctors really have been in, in, empowered to engage with the program, get the medical advice that they need to confirm the diagnosis and initiate prompt and appropriate treatment. Since the analysis in 2013, we've continued to improve both our mortality rates and the time to antibiotics. And that mortality is now down to 13.37%, which we're very proud of. The program has been spread from the emergency departments to the wards, and we have both adult, paediatric, maternal, and newborn sepsis pathways. And we also have integrated a 48-hour management plan into those pathways, which is additional to what was published in the MJA. And that's been particularly important for the ongoing care of our patients once they've had the initial resuscitation, and particularly if they end up going to the wards and not to the intensive care unit. The published analysis was on 13,500 patients. Now we have 35,000 patients in our database, and that's probably only half of those actually on the pathway, because they don't have to put the patients in the database, and as you all know, you know entering data is pretty, pretty onerous. But sepsis kills is in 200 hospitals, and it's part of everyday work. And that achievement has been recognized now internationally. Last year we received a Global Sepsis Alliance Award, which is fantastic. It's been a significant collaboration of clinicians and healthcare leaders. And really, this award for us is about the clinicians, and we'd sincerely like to thank them and acknowledge them for their massive amount of work and their enthusiasm with implementing the program, because it really, the award really is about them. We're continuing to evaluate the program, and we look forward to the opportunity to publish our next results in the MJA. I'll pass to Mary Louise. Thank you. I'm just going to say just a few words to follow on from Mary. I'd like to thank the MJA and the MDA for this wonderful honour. I'd also like to thank the University of New South Wales, who's allowed me to provide my time and expertise to the Clinical Excellence Commission on this and many other patient safety programmes. As you know, in a time of uh, financial stress and pressure of both the universities and, of course, health, it's a wonderful thing to bring academic rigor and clinical expertise together. And I think this award actually is testament to the value of doing both of that. This is the seventh paper I've had the delight to work with as either a lead or a co-author with the Clinical Excellence Commission. And this was Tony Burrell's last paper before his retirement from a brilliant clinical um, career. And so I, he did this just before his retirement. So now we have to continue as a team to uphold his standard, a uh, very high standard. And thank you very much for recognizing it. Our next award is one of my favourites. As chair of the AMA Indigenous Health Task Force, I take a very strong interest in the AMA Indigenous Peoples Medical Scholarship. Most of you in the room will know that this scholarship now has achieved DGR status. And if we haven't already hit you up to make donations to this worthy work, that will be coming very soon. The hope is that a future president might be able to stand up here and award a whole number of scholarships. Established in 1994, the scholarship aims to help increase the number of Indigenous doctors in Australia. 
Valued at $9,000 for each year of study, the scholarship provides support and encouragement for Indigenous medical students. The winner of the 2017 AMA Indigenous Peoples Medical Scholarship is Mr James Chapman. James is a second year medical student at the University of New South Wales. His story is inspiring. As a 13 year old, James watched his father, a proud indigenous man from Ulare country, die after a short seven week battle with acute myeloid leukemia. As a school leaver, he became his mother's carer for 12 months as she recovered from brain surgery. He came to understand that his father was a victim of the gap that exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. After his father's death, James travelled with his grandfather to return his father to Ulare country, which covers northwest New South Wales and southwest Queensland. While on this journey, he learnt a lot about his people's culture, as well as witnessing rural communities with high Indigenous populations that were clearly suffering from health inequities. He was shocked to see communities with access only to a visiting doctor and a nurse. While doing his HSC, he dreamed of one day becoming a doctor, but was discouraged by his teachers. He began an arts degree, majoring in Indigenous studies, but his study had to be put off while he cared for his ill mother. Constantly in clinical environments, his dream of becoming a medical professional became more intense. After his mother recovered, he began a science degree with the intention of entering postgraduate medicine studies. But he then discovered an entry program for Indigenous students to study medicine at the University of New South Wales. James intends to study from Wagga Wagga from his third year onwards to experience rural health and specifically rural and remote Indigenous healthcare. He hopes to become a GP working with Indigenous women and children in rural and remote Australia. Uh, we wish him every success I'm sure you'll all agree uh, that he's a uh, highly worthy recipient. Please join me in congratulating James Chapman. Thank you, President Gannon. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of this land in which we meet and any elders past and president, uh, present. Sorry. Um, uh, president Gannon has given quite a bit of my story in his speech there, um, but um, basically I was asked to give you a bit of a rundown on, on who I am and, and my journey into medicine. Um, so my name is James. I'm a proud Ilari I man. I live in Wollongong and I study medicine in Sydney. Um, I, make the tr uh, I make the commute every day of the week and some Saturdays. So why this madness? Um, <laughs> I, I suffer through terrible drivers, um, terrible talk back, and um, just, yeah, terrible, t terrible traffic. Um, so in my life, I've had a few heroes, um, two of which, my father and my uncle, both uh, strong, proud Indigenous men, um, lost their lives to disease and preventable disease at that. These are two, two, two of my heroes uh, fell victims to the gap that exists between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. As part of my grieving process, I took my uh, uncle and my, uh, grand, uh, my, un my uncle, my father's remains to my grandfather's hometown. He was born on a property called Karawilangai, which is his Nurumba. It's the place where a man's spirit enters the earth and it's also where it uh, is returned when its physical uh, being ceases. Along the way, we stayed in towns like Walgett, and I met a lot of my family, and it was a, such an incredible experience to be um, talking and sharing stories with other living Yularii men and women. But it was when I was watching my grandfather um, off the bank of the, of the river when he was hunting for yabbies, something occurred to me, and it was what happens to my culture and my grandfather's culture, my dad's culture, and my family's story when people like my grandfather and myself cease. My quest became to preserve my culture through medicine and uh, becoming an Indigenous doctor. Um, I'm in my second year of what will be a long road and um, I can assure you it's going to be a, a lifelong journey that's never going to be end, a never-ending. Addressing Indigenous health 
closing the gap and recruiting more of my Indigenous brothers and sisters to take up a degree in medicine or a health-related uh, profession isn't a one-man job. But I take great pride in knowing that I'm part of a, of a, a population of young Indigenous doctors, medical students and health professionals that are aiming to do just what I'm setting out to do, and that's preserve my culture. So that means I will definitely take terrible talk back, <laughs> peak hour traffic for the next four years, uh, for, the next, for the rest of my life, that means I can do something about it. Thank you again to the AMA. This is definitely a win for myself, but I feel it's more of a win for my Indigenous community. I hope that my, um, uh, sorry, I hope that um, my work in medicine is reflected in positive um, and healthy outcomes for my Indigenous people. And I also hope that by me standing here today gives the motivation to uh, one Indigenous kid to pursue their dreams and um, take up a degree in, in medicine or a health-related profession. Um, I'd finally just like to thank my mum for coming down today. Um, she got a very rapid introduction to living with a medical student. Thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Thank you very much, James. That was a great speech. Um, well, that's it for the morning. Um, uh, against incredible odds, we seem to be almost on schedule. Uh, so lunch, and we'll see you back at 12.55. Lunch is immediately opposite in, the, in Sophie's Lounge. Please visit the Doctor's Portal um, booth and the CPD booth and the Careers booth. These are all in, in extraordinary initiatives by your AMA. Uh, urgency motions uh, are due right now and we'll see you at 12.55. Thank you. <laughs>